kind of give a framework of where we are. Never don't mind you. Just spend some time on that. I've got it. It's all yours, Dan. Yeah. Run with it. How about July? Are you going to be around? Um, well, we ought to hit the golf course. Oh, It'd get you out there. I'd love to go play. <laughs> Commissioner Kaufman Gomez, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Brown, here, Commissioner Bertrand, Commissioner Olenek. We have a quorum. Okay, good. We'll begin. Uh, we'll start with uh, oral communications. This is anybody from the public can talk on some, any items that are not on our agenda. Please uh, come on up and tell us your name, and you have three minutes to talk. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rebecca Downing, and I'm president of the Seacliff Improvement Association. We are inviting pedestrians 
bicyclists, friends, neighbors, and the RTC commissioners to stroll with us to the Aptos Village Green on the morning of August 3rd, 2019. Our invitation is for you to join us by walking to Aptos Village from Seacliff to get a street view of the safety challenges pedestrians face when we walk to Aptos Village. We will also invite neighbors from the other parts of Aptos to join us along the way to help create pedestrian safety awareness along their route. Upon arriving in the village, participants will take a quick pedestrian survey, enjoy a snack from one of our event sponsors, New Leaf Community Market, and enter to win prizes from local Aptos Village merchants. The first 100 arrivals will also receive a reusable shopping bag from New Leaf Market. In 2017, we surveyed our members and other Aptos residents, and almost 90% of them said they would walk to Aptos Village if it was safe. So we will share what we learned from our survey with you to improve pedestrian safety measures for those walking and cycling to and from Aptos Village. Saturday mornings, well, every morning, can be difficult as traffic backs up through Aptos Choke Point on the northbound side of Highway 1. Those who opt to use Soquel Drive through Aptos Village add to the congestion of the locals trying to visit village businesses. Our hope is that this event creates pedestrian safety awareness for all those who drive through Aptos Village. Each of us who walk will take a car off the road. We want drivers to appreciate this by respecting pedestrians and cyclists who take up much less road space than a car. I've brought invitations for each of you and look forward to your RSVP. For the full experience, I suggest you start your He knows the way. Thank you for your time. Thank like you. the invitations too. Party at Zach's. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And what I'd like to do this morning uh, is to share some uh, other transportation people's uh, things that they do in their cities. I've been doing a lot of travel lately, is why I haven't been to too many of these meetings. Um, this is the uh, TahoeInDepth.org remaking of Highway 50, uh, which part of it goes into South Shore. And I'll have to read just some blurbs from one of the articles. There's three in here on their transportation goals. What this will do is turn the old highway alignment through South Shore and the casinos into a two-lane main street. Uh, the plans to date call for better pedestrian and bike infrastructure throughout the area, better transit services, landscaping, treescape amenities, and a pedestrian bridge. The project is planning safety improvements and community amenities such as parks, sidewalks, and lighting for the adjacent Rocky Point neighborhood, mainly because that was used instead of the Highway 50, which is four lanes, they would go around and try to go through the residential areas, which we're all having issues with that. Uh, Carol Chaplin states that he wants the project not only to improve traffic and transit and pedestrian infrastructure and housing on the South Shore, but also make it easier for people to get out of their cars and enjoy Lake Tahoe. The project can do this, she said, by creating a core area where people can walk out of their hotel room Go to the lake, go to the mountains, go shopping, dine, take a walk or a bike ride, find entertainment, or hop on a bus, never having to use their car. The other two articles are very similar in nature. I'm not going to just read those, but the, the main theme here is they're trying to get people out of their cars. And one of the things that they're not doing in this article is putting in anything that considers any highway widening. Uh, and so I have three questions for this commission. At what point in time do we stop building infrastructure for single occupancy vehicles? Number two, how bad does it have to get before we initiate and start funding a robust mass transit system? And when will this commission start to help reduce the cause of climate change instead of contributing by widening highways? 
I want to thank you for your time, and it's nice to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? It's okay to go ahead and line up so we know who wants to talk. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Acton. I'm a lifelong SLV resident, and I'm also the president of the uh, BCBA, the Boulder Creek Business Association. Um, I want to start by applauding um, Supervisor McPherson, uh, Caltrans, and the RTC on their successful installation of the first RRFB in downtown Boulder Creek. Um, I read through the corridor plan, and um, I'm very appreciative of all the work that went into that. Um, thank you, Rachel and Brianna at the RTC for all the outreach that they've done to create such a complete and thorough document. Uh, the ball seems like it's starting to move right now, which is very exciting after so many years. Uh, everyone in town is eager to see the improvements that the corridor plan calls for. Uh, the reason I'm here today is- I'm gonna to interrupt you for a second. Yes, sir. This is an oral communications about things that are not on the agenda and it appears you're talking about the Highway 9 corridor. Is there other people that are gonna talk on Highway 9 corridor? They're not gonna be here, are they? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, are, how many people are going to talk about Highway 9? Oh, do, you, okay. do you want me to finish then? Uh, if do, if do you're you the only one that's going to speak, I'm going to let you finish. Okay? okay, I just want to make clear that this is oral communications. If you have somewhere to go, I can appreciate that. I, I got to go to work, so and, I, I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry finish, about that. Finish Thank you. Your, uh, your conversation, and if everyone else can wait for the Highway 9 section, we'd appreciate that. Sorry, you guys. All right, so I'm out of out of role, but anyway, let me, let me finish, thank you. Um, so I just wanna say that um, there are a lot of projects cited as high priority, including reducing speed and other safety measures. Um, these echo the concerns at all of our town meetings, at all of our mixers, at all of the online community forums. Um, projects enhancing corridor pedestrian safety via lighting, laddering, RR, FBs, and other visit visibility augmenting devices, they're easy and they're relatively in inexpensive. Um, these are particularly needed in Brookdale, as well as the 236 and 9 intersections. As everybody knows, Boulder Creek uh, has been constructed along Highway 9. It's all controlled um, under the authority of Caltrans. For years, the residents, the visitors, and the business community have echoed the same request for improvements to a town that has not had um, very many meaningful enhancements pretty much in my entire lifetime. Um, now that we've had the community discussion, the RTC has formed this this plan, um, I'm here really just to encourage Caltrans um, to find a way to release the brake pedal on the holdups that we've been experiencing on these plans and to figure out a way to work with all these agencies to make our downtown a little bit safer. Uh, a great place to start, in our opinion, is uh, crosswalk bulb outs as well as back in parking spaces. These were graded as an A rating project with high performance for ease of implementation. The changes would slow traffic via road dieting, enhance the local economy by allowing additional and much needed parking spots, as well as provide shade tree planters for pedestrian and bike use. We'd like to see a study for a three-way stop at the Nine and Bear Creek intersection to slow cars down as they come into town. The community has done its work in contributing to the corridor plan. The county has facilitated many community discussions. The RTC has put a ton of effort into creating this, this plan. Um, I feel like now is the time for the governing agency for Caltrans to kind of step up to the plate and wait and figure out a way to break ground and make the corridor safer while helping the downtown businesses and the residents. So anyway, thank you for your time and I'm sorry to go out of order. No, no, thank you, I appreciate your comments. I was one other woman that has to go to work, I heard, uh, that needs to speak now and uh, why don't you come up and we're gonna let you speak, All right? You're welcome. Thank you. My name is Christine Praley. I'm a small business owner in Felton, California. I live in Ben Lomond. My business is Horse Sense Education and Advocacy, and I'm the Santa Cruz County Outreach Coordinator for 4-H. So on behalf of myself, my business, and those children that I teach, along with the school children that I teach through charter schools and the Valley's uh, school system, I just wanna thank you very much for taking time, energy, um, and due diligence to make sure that our roads are safer for pedestrian, bike, bicyclists. Um, they're even mentioning horses here. Um, I'm really grateful for that. So, you know, everything that you're doing for everybody so that we can all share the roadway and, and enjoy the beautiful mountains is really worth the effort. Um, I thank you again, also Caltrans. They do a lot of hard work, and I realize there's reasons for the brake pedals, but 
when you get through them that it becomes a better product. So again, I just want to thank you all. And I think, did you want to have show the others who are in support of that because you're speaking on behalf of them? Yeah. Is there, is there some uh, supporters that you have for this Highway 9 plan? Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to thank Joni Rachel. Martin for sending out the email this morning to ask people that, that, are, uh, that can make it to come down. And um, I believe those people wanted to take a stand. Uh, just If you could just stand up to show that you're supporting it, that would be great. Thank you for your attendance and uh, your, your motion. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. So I am, my name is Tim Onstead and I'm a concerned resident of the La Selva Beach area. I recently moved there from Capitola and when I lived in Capitola, I was really dependent on the bus service since I'm a rider and a college student. I don't have a car and I don't really have the money to have my own car. So I would take the bus everywhere and I would use my student ID for, you know, like the bus pass basically. But when I went to La Selva, I was surprised to see that well, maybe not so much surprised knowing what's on the signs in here, but they had discontinued bus service to La Selva. I don't know if that was a proposition or what it was, but the 54 and the 56 are no longer operating, and I know that because the um, bus stop like markers are still up there, even though there are no buses coming here, and it's been three years, so it's like either remove them or you know, reinstate busing, and it's become a bit of a grievance. And I know that there's a lot of pleasant walks, but the thing is, is that I'd rather only walk 10 minutes to the bus stop rather than 20 minutes to the nearest bus stop, which is over in Seascape. Right, thank you. I, I'm going to go ahead and respond to that, just, just to try to help you out a little bit. It says there, uh, there are a few members that are on this panel that also serve on the Metro uh, Board of Directors. and. Um, Couple issues. One is Metro went through some serious budget cuts, and part of that route was one of the routes that needed to be cut in order to continue service to other areas. It's our hope that when funding reappears, we'll be able to restore those routes. Your second item, as far as removing the bus stops, it is. Uh, it's not so much moving the bus stops, but rather, you know, why they're still there if there's no service. That's what I wanted to explain to you. Is the, the act of getting a bus stop established someplace, the process to put in that stop and that sign is a long process. Mm. And our intention is to try to restore service. So if we were to take those out, we would have to go through that entire process again to get city approval to re restore that stop and those poles. So I apologize that it's inconvenient and it does represent the fact that it appears that there might be bus service. But our intent, Metro's intent, is to someday restore those routes when, when funding appears. Right, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, I would uh, just add to that. Is that true year-round, or is it different in the summer uh, and during the school year? I haven't so lived for long enough to know. I've only moved just this week. Okay. Like, literally only last week I moved into the new place from Capitola. So I haven't lived long enough to know. We, we cut those year round. Okay. Those it could it could be round. that they only have it during the school season. Those, those are year round cuts, Greg. Cut it round. is great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank does you. that does that help? I, I know it doesn't solve your bus, but I just want to explain to you what how the nature of how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Keith Otto, 20-year county resident. Back in January, I and others from my community and many others across the, the county spoke out against rail north of Watsonville. Too costly to implement, too costly to maintain that maintenance being a forever liability. Too little benefit. Decisions were made. Even so, as I'm able, I've been trying to follow the happenings here at the RTC. There were some items at the meeting earlier this month which surprised me. Others gave me hope that there may be some adjustment in the direction of the commission. One commissioner was concerned that millions of, millions of dollars of federal funds expected for county road repair could be at risk. Yes, let's fix the local roads. Uh, another commissioner spoke of the time needed to make big decisions such as um, the alternatives for transit in the rail corridor, decisions that were stated to involve scores or 
a hundred million dollars we don't want to invest in projects that are not going to work with that was stated makes sense although the figure is totally off per the corridor study the cost for transit in the corridor is going to be greater than three hundred million dollars and just you know quick comparison three hundred million versus millions I believe single digit for for local road repair the priorities there seem obvious to me there was another commissioner that spoke of the disquiet of residents just trying to go about their daily lives with difficulties in commutes perhaps trying to get to the commission meeting here priorities should focus on those individuals there were concerns about local budgets that were expressed and that there's not going to be funding for apt aspirational projects there was a gentleman from County uh, Public Works, I believe, that stated, if we're not taking care of what we already have, but rather creating more stuff that we're not sure how we're going to take care of in the future, we think that's the wrong way to go. I completely agree. You know, the bottom line, my ask is that we listen to each other. You folks have been studying this for a long time. There's a lot of good ideas and practicalities here within this group. Let's focus on fixing what we have. Let's avoid liabilities for the future. Let's focus on more of what's practical versus aspirational. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I was going to say something else about dynamism, but I've run out of time. OK. Come back next meeting. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak in oral communications? We'll go ahead and close oral communications. We'll move on. Uh, is there any additions or deletions to the, our regular agenda? Uh, there's no additions or deletions, but a uh, quick um, clarification or correction on um, item 16. The page numbering was off in the printed version. It printed 17 instead of 16. So um, the online edition is correct. So when you're going through your agenda, if you're flipping pages and you see 17 and we're talking about item 16, that's why. 17-1 is actually 16-1. Yes, but there's a, another 17-1 for item one right 17 behind, it, behind it. Thank you. And then there's just uh, two handouts, one for item 17 and one for item 18. Thank you. Okay, it brings us to the consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with in one motion. The, uh, is there anybody who would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Anyone from the public like to comment on anything on the consent agenda? Move approval of the consent agenda. A motion for approval for the consent. Oh, so many. Excuse me a second. Is there a second for that? I have a second. Second, second that. Go ahead, comment. sir, for your comment. Yeah, Keith Otto, a 20 year county resident. So, um, with regards to item five, as far as public participation plan, I was very happy to see that. There's a number of folks in my community that have been asking about what the particulars are with regards to um, projects related to the rail corridor in our community, what the process is for that, and how the community might be able to realistically engage and participate to direct projects in a manner which um, I guess is uh, you know, the most desirable or the least undesirable is the way some would put it. So my ask is in conjunction with this plan that perhaps there's a, let's say a two page summary of items related to the rail corridor and the process and, and um, items where the public may be able to participate within the county. So, um, so that could be the items around the RTC and your con contractors and consultants as well as for the county, the public works, and the planning commission and whatnot, basically to participate or to you know, speak up at public comment at the end of the process when things are sort of designed and the cement's about to get poured, obviously that's way too late. But folks are trying to understand what the different agencies are and what those different um, points would be for them to participate. And if there could be some sort of summary document, I'm in the county, so that's of um, that's my personal priority. Obviously, the process would be a little bit different for the city of Santa Cruz or Capitola, but I think that would be beneficial for all for people to come forward and, uh, and put forth their perspective. You know, it can get a little bit ugly to put up with a number of us, but at the same time, it's those opinions and perspectives 
um, that ultimately lead to better projects and better outcomes and solutions that work better for the wider community. So thank you if you can you know, do that. Director Rock, can you have a comment? I have a response. You should look at you should look at item 18 on this agenda. You can get that the uh, packet for it, which gives you the information online at our website, or you could probably ask our staff person for maybe we have an extra copy of that packet. That lays out a plan because we're going to spend the next year planning what the public uh, transit aspect of that project will be, and it, we're working on it today on our agenda is a scope of work which includes public <coughs> participation. So that's we're definitely answering your request here. Right, so that is related to the transit piece, but as far as the other aspects of the project, whether that's the freight and whatnot, um, the trail components and so on, there's, I mean, I see, that, I see that, and I also saw the items as associated with uh, this item, Agenda 5, I believe, um, and that's all a good step in the right direction. I think to distill that down a little further would be helpful, um, at least for the folks that I'm uh, talking to in my community. Uh, let, let me, uh, Director Preston, do you have anything you want to add to that? Anything the RTC has available that might uh, assist this gentleman? Um, I would highly recommend that you get in contact with uh, Shannon Munz of my office. She's our communication specialist, and she can work with you on that. Okay, great. Yeah, and I'll say I've reached out to the county, and um, the details coming back thus far have um, in less than robust. I'll just I think that. you should try this avenue that yeah. was just no, suggested that's great. you. I okay. That. Now, we have a dedicated staff person for public um, participation <coughs> and outreach. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else like to comment on anything in the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. We have a mo Sir, yes, you have a comment? I'm not sure if I'm in the right order here, but Which I'm... Which item are you wishing to speak on? I'm wishing to speak on 3.36 uh, of the plan. I'm a homeowner on Lazy Woods. Okay. And we, we, this is on the Highway 9. This is for a bus stop. Okay, we're not, we're not there yet. Okay. okay. We're, we're still doing the consent agenda. We get to item... That's item 17. We get to that. You can come up and speak. Thank you for your time. I'll okay, right great. Back. All right. With that, we have a motion and a second on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. Brings us to our regular agenda, which starts with item 13, uh, commissioner's report. Commissioner's report. Any oral reports from commissioners? Kaufman Gomez. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry for our tardiness um, in commuting um, that Highway 1. I just wanted to share with you that the emphasis that we've put on when it came to our city council for the budgets for some of these projects, and that was for us to explore further um, the funding differences that are needed, that, that shortfall for the Lee Road project for Watsonville. So we're really pushing that forward to try and move that project along a little further than the timeline that was provided. And the goal is that the staff is going to look for more funding options that may be available to fix that, that um, set the offset so we can get that project moving along. Great. Thanks. Any other comments from the commissioners? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go to item 14, which is our director's report. Hi. I have an oral report today just uh, touching on two quick items. Um, the first one is the regional bike signage project. The countywide bike route signage uh, project is currently in the construction phase. Uh, this week, crews are completing the installation of over 100 signs in the city of Santa Cruz and beginning the installation of signs in the unincorporated county. That'll be followed by uh, work in, in uh, the various cities. Discretionary funding. At the June 6th RTC meeting, I was directed to meet with stakeholders for input into a proposed process and timeline for the prog programming of RTC's discretionary funds with the intention to support the distribution of the RSTPX STPG funds by formula basis to the local jurisdictions for the current round of funding. On Monday, I met with the public work directors for the four cities in the county. Santa Cruz Metro representatives were also in attendance. There was a clear understanding that the RTC is still mandated to apportion the STPG, RSTPX funds for projects implemented by the cities in the county and other transportation agencies on a fair and equitable basis based upon an annual and updated five-year average of allocations. Projects shall be nominated by cities, counties, transit operators, and other public transportation agencies through a process that directly involves local government representatives. Projects will still be required to be programmed in the FTIP. 
distributing the next round of RSTPX STBG funds by formula to the counties and cities will provide a reliable fund source to those jurisdictions for the next three years. There was discussion about the types of projects that recipients jurisdictions may nominate, including major maintenance of the local street network, highway projects, active transportation projects, and other non-infrastructure education programs that have traditionally been nominated by the RTC. Local jurisdictions understood that the RTC would no longer be able to fund some of these projects and may be asked, and they may be asked to fund them in the future. Although there was discussion of providing a percentage of the funds to Metro, the public works directors expressed a desire that Metro be funded from other funding sources if possible. There was discussion about using the remaining discretionary fund sources, those other than RSDPX and STPG funds, for Metro and other regional projects, including the Harkins Slough project, if they are eligible and cannot be funded by other means, such as grants or Measure D. Since the State Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP estimate and guidelines were not yet released, Discussion about programming the other discretionary funding was somewhat limited. It was agreed that Metro would assess its needs so that an analysis could be done as to how RTC should program its remaining discretionary funds. <coughs> Assuming no RSDPX funds are programmed to Metro, there was consensus among the public works directors that the formula distribution should be done on population with a 5% floor. The floor would benefit Capitola and Scotts Valley, whose annual share of the funding would not be enough to fund a typical project need. I requested that the public works directors discuss and get concurrence from their CAO and city managers, respectively. The group is expected to meet again in a month. I expect to make a recommendation at December 5th RTC meeting. That concludes my report. Great. Thank you. Any questions uh, for the director? Okay. None? Well, I'm just uh, I'm just kind of curious uh, uh, about the Metro portion and the funds there. I mean, how much has Metro gotten from this, these funds in the past? Um, that question was asked at the meeting, and it's been asked by various commissioners. Um, it varies um, year to year. Um, and it's, it's why it's really hard to look at one funding source in a silo. Often the the Metro is funded from the STIP. There have been years where 100% of the STIP needed to go to, to public transit, and there's years w where the STIP um, had zero money available for public transit. So um, Metro, you know, several years ago received 100% of the funding, and so they held off it in future years in, in deciding how much of the funding they would get. It's important to also understand that there's been significant changes in the STIP as um, a result of uh, Senate Bill 1. Um, they moved a lot of the transit funding from the STIP to the um, STA funds, so they now receive a higher percentage or a higher pot from STA funds, and the STIP funds estimate is lower than it used to be in prior years. So it's, it's really important to understand that it, it kind of jumps all over the place, so we looked at it at this is a one-year round of funding, and we really wanted to see what Metro's needs were over the next three years, three, three to five years, because the STIP estimate is the last two years, whereas we were looking at the next three years of the RSTPX fund. Thank you. In 25 words, can you uh, explain the difference, the acronyms, STA, the STIP? <gasps> I think I don't know that everybody understands them about the availability or just uh, very briefly. Okay, well, the, the STIP is the, the State Transportation Improvement Program, and that um, was generally set up for the, the highway system originally, but it's available for a lot of different projects, in including transit. But the CTC comes out with guidelines on that. Um, uh, the California Transportation Commission. I know, there's a lot of acronyms. And then there's other funds. Go, go, the other go. funding sources are, are more specific to transit. Just for clarification, I, I, I've been meeting with uh, the uh, CEO of Metro and with uh, Mr. Preston trying to work this triangle of, of funding. And uh, the, the course that we're on or the next meeting, which is going to involve the CAOs and city managers. 
integral part of, of this process. And, and I'm actually awaiting the STIP uh, allocations to come out, and then, with then we'll have all the information that we can, I think, make a good decision in either August or September to move forward on this. So thank you for all the hard work you've done putting those meetings together. And, and right after that meeting, the STIP estimate did come out. It was less than expected, and it did restrict funding on PTA funds. But um, if um, Metro's projects are federalized, and generally they are, they would be eligible. So, but it is um, less than expected. It's only guaranteed to be 2.6 million, and it's in the last three years. Whereas the RSTP exchange funds, which is about 3 million a year, would be for this year and the next two. So 100% um, of the money would be going, of the new money programming capacity would be going to the local jurisdictions. And those, STIP funds that we haven't decided on would be the latter two years, and it's important to differentiate between that. Great. Good information. Director Rockman. So is my understanding correct that you're not, although they're, you're leaning toward, in the end, having this be a formula for the um, cities and the county local road projects, um, the final decision is not going to be made until we actually know what money is available from the STIP and, and uh, so we can actually see the big, the full picture. Do I understand correctly what you just said? Well, I'm not advocating for anything per se. I, the direction I received was was to go that route. So I'm I'm following the direction that I received and working on a formula distribution, which we'll bring back to you in September, for for you guys to decide. I appreciate that because, in I mean, I think there were two things going on in that motion from our group. Others can correct me if I don't you know properly characterize it, but partly it was if the transit district is not completely savaged by this decision, then if the money that goes to the local jurisdiction should be by formula and populate, you know, apparently they like it to be by population with a 5% and so forth, which is fine. But until we know that the transit district has some money left out of all of this, I don't think this body wants to sort of make I don't, I don't want to get too far into the weeds because it's not an agenda item, but the, it's on our agenda to come back and discuss that, and, and all, the, all the information will be at that September meeting for us to make a, a decision. And, and it does include the regional projects, too, that, um, that the local jurisdictions would likely not be willing to fund. Thank you for that report. That concludes your report? Yes. Thank you. Uh, it takes us to item 15, which is the Caltrans report. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Olenek. I'm a planning manager at Caltrans District 5. I'm glad to be here today and uh, deliver a little bit of an introduction and a uh, report. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is work zone safety. The construction season has definitely kicked off with a bang, as we've all probably noticed, is driving uh, on the highways. And that's as a result of many things, SB1 funding, uh, plans that have now being implemented for projects. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a lot going on. So. Uh, but with that, we last week, along with our partner uh, CHB and the Office of Traffic Safety, we kicked off a B Work Zone Alert public awareness campaign, imaging shown on the screens here this morning, to remind drivers to slow down when going through construction zones and also when passing highway workers. Uh, again, the season is off to a large start, so there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, the campaign aim aims to protect workers uh, from traffic that are literally inches away from uh, the, the, the traveled roadway. Um, as, the, as Caltrans and our partners also continue to work towards zero deaths, we wanna reduce that in our work zones especially. And that's important because in 2018, more than 7,000 work zone collisions happened. And of those 7,000, there were 2,300 uh, injuries and 46 fatalities of uh, highway workers, both contractors and public workers. So th part of this campaign is to help address that. And so a question might be, what can we all do individually uh, as a communities? Well, certainly when we see work zones, we wanna slow down. When we see maintenance activities or any emergency services on the side of the road, <clears throat> there's the move over law that's already in place. We wanna do our best to abide by that, to move over or, or slow down. Uh, and th those are just things individually we can do. But Caltrans, we're also on our side for our projects, working to take it to even the next level. Uh, we're kicking off this year some pretty significant enhancements to our work zone uh, protocols and some of our closures. Some of the things we're looking at is to expand some of the time even during our construction uh, work periods. So a lot of times we, we, we craft our work periods to deal with the, what we feel is probably the best thing we can do for 
traffic for seasons, but that also takes a lot of time and a lot of exposures for closure setup, for takedown. So one of the things we're looking at is if we can expand the work zone period, then that puts less days on the road overall, less time for setup and closure, that's one thing. Another element that maybe you've noticed already is our work zones are now going to include speed, uh, radar speed feedback signs uh, to be complemented with a 10 mile an hour reduction in the speed limit through work zones. So we're really, for a variety of reasons, the most important being the life and safety of our workers uh, and, and those that of the motoring public, we're, we're taking whatever steps we can and whatever uh, positive approaches that are available to us to help uh, improve work zone safety. The campaign includes uh, the public awareness billboards. These are not paid children. These are actually uh, uh, family members of high work Caltrans employees. And a part of the messaging in our public awareness campaigns is they want to have their parents come home every night. So that's what I wanted to report on. We want to encourage uh, all of us as public works agencies and those in the public, maybe some of the public are even contractors working themselves on the road. So uh, a, a big shout to Work Zone Safety uh, kicking off this year. Thank you. That's all I have to report on. Thank you. I think for all of us, we've noticed the, the uh, repaving of Highway 17. It looks like it's about 95% done. We all greatly appreciate that. But I do notice that um, you mentioned that they're inches away. And, I, and at night when I drive through there, it, uh, it is inches away. So the speed zone, we should all take caution for on those roads at night, the work they're trying to do. They're doing a fabulous job. They're almost done. And I'm sure they're all going to celebrate when they finish it because it looks very hazardous to me. So thank you for that comment. Any questions? Mr. Tapper. Sure. Yeah, I want to thank you for uh, Caltrans, the work you've done in the past for District 4. Uh, I don't expect you to give an instant analysis on my question, uh, but in, in the city of Watsonville, Highway 152 does go through there, and then it goes by the high school and this whole uh, thing, and Highway 1 really feeds into Highway 52. Uh, how much control does the city actually have when a, when a freeway actually goes through the city. And uh, if they were gonna take four lanes and reduce it down to two lanes, and whether or not they were gonna add, uh, you know, roundabouts. Uh, Caltrans can, uh, what, has the ultimate veto power? I, I suppose the short answer would be yes, as the owner operator. But the reality is, is it, it starts well before that. Uh, at implementation of um, right sizing of roads, roundabouts, other improvements, that always comes first with a good planning study to, and, and follow that an implementation strategy. And in there is operational analysis. So I, I know we've been working with the city on, on those things. Uh, we've been, uh, we've actually, we've funded uh, some planning grants to the city sure. to allow them to look at those type of elements. So there are definitely opportunities when those plans are completed to then start discussing implementation. And th there's definitely a lot of things at play. You know, the operational thing is important because uh, as I recall, there's also, there's a fairly heavy freight movement that uses those highways as well. Sure. So those are all the things that are kind of taken into consideration as part of the balance. Um, the, the next level, what does happen sometimes is a, an agency, a community will decide that uh, dis despite maybe what might be negative operational impacts, they still are really interested in these improvements. So there have been occasions, and I believe we have been in conversation with the city of Watsonville for opportunities if the city would like to take ownership under a relinquishment scenario. And so that has occurred in some, in some areas of our district all over the state, really. So uh, that, that's just another one of the alternative scenarios that could occur. Okay, and then one uh, little more specific. Uh, I keep reminding uh, Caltrans, and I've talked to your office, they've been very kind, uh, and that would be the uh, enhanced crosswalk at uh, East Beach and Marchant Street, uh, right in front of uh, the Watsonville High School. And that's actually on the one-way e extension of uh, Highway 152, which is East Lake Avenue. So I, th I think that's still on, um, uh, it's, at, it's, at, it's moving forward. And I, was, I think I was told it would be uh, early uh, fall that they're going to actually start working on it. Does that? Do you know that? I, I hate to put you on the spot because it's a specific one. I, I, I have to apologize. I don't know the exact detail of uh, when that would be implemented, but I do recall the conversation and topic. Sure. Uh, it seems like uh, I recall some correspondence between Cal Caltrans and your office, so uh, we can take that as a follow-up to see you know where that stands. And that has a lot to do with the safety because uh, during school hours they do have. 
um, you know, probably close to 1,700 students that are crossing that street, not only in the morning going to school, but also at lunch. They have open campus, and then also after school and sports programs in the afternoon. So anyway, uh, that would be part of your safety program, so hopefully we can get that done. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Olenek, for that report. Okay, moves on to item 16, which is a uh, Measure D strategic implementation plan. Uh, Mr. Preston. Yes. <clears throat> so in accordance with the Measure D ordinance, the RTC allocates, administers, and oversees the expenditure of all measure revenue, which is not directly allocated by formula annually to other agencies, consistent with an implementation plan. As required by, or as stated in the ordinance, the purposes of an imp implementation plan are to define the scope, cost, and delivery schedule of each expenditure plan project or program, detail revenue projections, and possible financing tools needed to deliver the expenditure plan within the 30 years promised to the voters, and describe the risks, critical <coughs> issues, and opportunities that the RTC, as the local transportation authority, should address to expeditiously deliver the expenditure plan. The RTC is beginning the process of developing an inaugural strategic implementation plan for Measure D revenues by identifying program ob objectives and goals supported by sound financial objectives. The process is expected to be completed during the upcoming fiscal year of 2019 to 2020. On June 6, 2019, the RTC authorized the executive director to enter into an agreement with KNN Public Finance, a municipal advisory firm to provide financial advisory services and the planning and analysis related to the development of the Measure D SIP. KNN is here today to give you a presentation. Um, included um, um, in, in attendance here today is uh, David Leifer, and I had the pleasure of working with David Leifer um, when I was. Uh, Director of Projects and Programming for the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, and he assisted me in the delivery of multiple strategic plans in the past. David serves as manager of KNN and has approximately 30 years of municipal finance experience, including five years as an attorney and 24 years as a financial advisor. Also in attendance is Melissa Schink, Schick, and Melissa has over 15 years of combined public sector and public finance investment banking and municipal advisor experience. David, the mic is yours. Great. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We have a presentation just so others can see it. We'll put it up on the screen. Okay, good morning. Uh, as Guy mentioned, my name is David Leifer. I'm joined uh, today by my colleague, Melissa Schick, who's gonna share the presentation with me. Uh, we work for KNN Public Finance. We are a municipal advisory firm. We've been retained by the commission to help, as Guy said, with the planning and analysis needs related to the development of a Measure D strategic implementation plan and to advise related to bonding and other sort of borrowing tools. Um, let's see, just to, by way of background about what a municipal advisory firm is, there's a regulatory framework. Congress has regulated our little niche of the world in public finance. They have assigned to firms like ours a fiduciary duty, which means we are uh, obliged to put our clients' interests ahead of our own. The idea is we are here to provide analysis, objective analysis and advice to support uh, informed and, and we hope prudent decision making uh, by, by policymakers. So that's our role and we look forward to, uh, I, I think this will probably be the first of several occasions when we'll be in front of you to help uh, answer questions and provide briefings over the next several years. Uh, by way of background, we've put some logos up of some of the other agencies, Guy mentioned Sonoma. We work with your peers in Monterey and San Benito. 
I see Santa Barbara's not up there. They're a client. We do uh, strategic planning uh, and bonding assistance with all of these agencies. So we have a lot of experience working with self-help county transportation programs and particularly programs that have inaugural taxes and might be doing bonding for the very first time. Um, the purpose of the presentation today is to do a couple of things. One, we want to introduce the, the process by which a strategic implementation plan is developed and what some of its purposes are. Uh, we want to introduce you a little bit to uh, some bonding concepts because bonding is one of the important tools that can be used to deliver projects on an accelerated basis. And then we know there's some interest uh, by the county and others in uh, potentially looking at bonding against the uh, direct allocation shares, not just bonding for regional projects, but bonding for potentially local projects. And so at the end of the presentation, I'm going to introduce that topic and, and talk to uh, some of the different tools that are available and some potential policies that you as a, as a, as a commission board may want to consider uh, to guide that process. Okay, so um, as Guy mentioned, the, the, the voters approved an expenditure plan. The expenditure plan we're going to talk about, but it guides the allocation percentages for the expenditure of money. Uh, what a strategic implementation plan does is provide a roadmap, in a sense, uh, to the feasibility of actually delivering projects. Over what period of time can projects be reasonably expected to be delivered? What additional funds, if any, might be needed? What sort of borrowing tools, if any, might be needed to deliver the projects on the schedule uh, that is desired? So there are a number of sort of levers and, and, and trade-offs in developing the strategic plan. It's a, it's a uh, but as I say, it's a roadmap, and it's going to get updated regularly. We're going to talk about that, and, um, and, and, and that process is sort of an iterative process. So here I've outlined what I'd say is sort of the four elements of the plan. We're going to talk a little bit more about each of these as we go through the presentation, but first is the overall framework where we look at what are the projects, what are the, the construction schedules expected, uh, what's the timing that's desired? Then we're going to look at the revenue side. Uh, how much money do you have? How much growth is there expected to be? That's going to impact the timing and delivery of projects, of course, uh, which is why it's important to update these plans regularly because we can make forecasts, but uh, we need to update that for reality. Uh, and then we want to integrate other information, other outside funding sources that uh, may be available to you to deliver the plan. We're going to take all that information, we're going to dump it into a cash flow model. We'll show you a sample in a few pages, just a glorified Excel spreadsheet, uh, revenues, expenditures, and then we'll see after we drop in all those capital expenditures, where are their shortfalls? And we say, okay, we got all these capital expenditures, but we're bringing in <coughs> revenues every year, and so we may have some shortfalls. And then we're going to look at what are the tools to plug those shortfall holes, and bonding is one of those tools. Of course, bonding comes at a cost, so what's the trade-off with that in terms of the overall delivery of dollars for projects over the 30-year life? So we're going to do a bonding capacity analysis as part of, the, uh, part of the process. And then as part of this process, we want to help you uh, develop some policies uh, related to sort of financial tools, borrowing, inter-program borrowing, use of reserves, loans, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, as part of that, is what we're doing today, which is providing some workshops or, or training uh, for, for the board and for staff and, and for any other stakeholders that you think are important to be included in the process. Um, just one last uh, short page on the, on the the plan itself, we've sort of talked about the planning process. Now we're going to talk about the actual strategic implementation plan, which will be developed and ultimately approved by your board. Um, really, these, these six bullets here, sub-bullets, are all the things we just talked about. But this is what you'll find in the plan. There'll be revenue allocations uh, along the lines of the expenditure plan. Then we'll look at sales tax revenue forecasts. And we have a slide on that to talk about some of the different methodologies that we might want to use to forecast revenues. Uh, of course, there'll be some discussion of the projects themselves and what the timelines are. And there could be discussions amongst yourself about the priorities, which should be delivered first and why, uh, what sources of leveraged uh, or, or matching funds are there, and then what is the bonding availability uh, to, to plug any shortfalls. And then finally, uh, there'll be a discussion in the plan about policies that impact uh, the financial implementation of the plan. 
Uh, many uh, sales tax agencies provide updates to their plan on a, typically on a biannual basis. It could be more frequently, uh, but we want to accommodate changes in project cost, matching funds, you know, revenue growth. All of these assumptions which will go into the plan become uh, more certain uh, as more time passes. And so we would expect uh, that this plan would be updated uh, you know, at least every two years and uh, the plan itself and any updates would be approved and discussed uh, by your board. So what I want to do now is turn it over to Melissa. She's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the details that are going to go into the, the plan, on, on, uh, particularly for regional, um, for regional projects. And then um, I'll pick it up uh, towards the end. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Melissa Schick, and pleasure to be here. Um, on the screen today is uh, the Measure D expenditure plan. Uh, so this is what was put forth before the, the voters uh, in 2016 and it drives uh, the allocation of Measure D revenues. Uh, in this case, there's direct allocation to cities and counties, um, and then there's also regional funding where dollars will be directed to various regional projects. Uh, the expenditure plan serves as the primary basis for your strategic plan, um, and so your strategic plan will program projects and revenues within the context of the expenditure plan. So we'll, what, what we'll do in our process is making sure dollars all stay in their appropriate uh, lanes, if you will. Um, the, in addition, the expenditure plan projected that Measure D will generate approximately 500 million over the life of the tax. That was assuming 17 annual um, uh, revenues of 17 million in 2016 dollars. So also the strategic plan will look at a realistic forecast of, of future growth uh, for Measure D. Uh, so along those lines, kind of the first thing we'll do with the staff and in the context of preparing uh, for the strategic planning process is look at Measure D revenues and start thinking about realis realistic assumptions for growth. Um, and that will really be the primary driver for us to estimate future resources available for project delivery. Um, there's various data points we utilize uh, to forecast uh, revenues, and this is just one example. We've charted historical taxable sales in Santa Cruz County. You'll see that there's a good amount of volatility of growth in any given year. Uh, just taking a five-year look back at, at growth, it's in approximately 4.3%. Approximately and then looking at a 20-year horizon, uh, the average annual growth rate is lower at 2.76%. So it's just looking at a lot of various uh, data and indices, also maybe working with local economic development departments and um, using this information to help us guide uh, the future resources of the Measure D tax. So apologies for a very busy slide, but this is an illustrative example of what a cash flow model may look like for your program. Uh, and really the cash flow model establishes the implementation framework for Measure D within the context of your expenditure plan. Uh, so what does it do? Uh, it forecasts annual sale tax available for projects based on a realistic assumption for growth of the revenues. Uh, and we put that into the model, and you'll see in the, the blue shaded rows at the top of the illustrative model, we've shown just a, an example of revenues coming in at the top, and then some uh, assumption for growth over time. Uh, the other thing a cash flow model does is it starts putting revenues and allocating revenues to it, their appropriate buckets uh, and funding allocations. So you'll see in the middle of the illustrative model, there's oftentimes a space to allocate revenues to direct allocation programs like you all have in addition to regional project programs. And then within each of those buckets, we um, look at the cash flow associated with money out to regional um, direct allocation programs in addition to the projects 
uh, and the timing of cash flows necessarily to necessary to deliver the larger scale regional projects. So um, there's a couple ways that we look at delivering regional projects uh, and actually a couple ways just to deliver uh, the larger scale projects. Some is just utilizing pay-go measure D revenues allocated uh, to that funding bucket. Um, but the, the drawback with pay-go is that doesn't necessarily always allow for the acceleration of large-scale capital projects. Uh, and the pay-as-you-go approach may be more applicable to direct allocation funding programs where it's just dollars in and dollars out on an annual basis. Uh, the second approach is uh, borrowing, uh, whether in the form of a, a short-term loan or bonds, to help accelerate shovel-ready rev projects. Um, and it may help minimize rising infrastructure and construction costs. Um, really, kind of the optimal financing plan will likely involve a mix of both pay-as-you-go funding as well as uh, some borrowing in, in the form of bonds or loans to deliver your regional projects. So turning back to the cash flow model, again, just the same uh, illustrative model, but in this instance, we've infused uh, proceeds from an example bond issuance in fiscal 2021 uh, to meet cash flow deficits uh, over a three-year period. So you'll see that the ending balance line within this illustrative model shows positive ending balance um, through fiscal 23, through some combination of cash flow uh, revenues being able to uh, support the annual projects and in addition to the issuance of bonds. You'll see in fiscal 23-24, in this example, we've highlighted the ending balance becomes negative again. And it would be likely that you, there would need to be another borrowing at that time, or some of the project expenditures would need to be pushed back just because there is not enough annual sales tax revenue uh, re revenues to support those projects. So what are some borrowing tools and options to help accelerate, <clears throat> excuse me, projects? And in this context, just really speaking of the regional programs, um, David will speak to local tools. Um, but really the primary tool utilized by your peers uh, in the self-help county um, space is long-term, the issuance of long-term sales tax revenue bonds. Um, there's other options within um, uh, loan programs with the federal government or the state, whether it be TIFIA or iBank loans, um, but probably the most efficient tool is a long-term sales tax revenue bond. Uh, we've also worked with um, transportation sales tax agencies that have utilized interim borrowing and that tends to be more with smaller scale projects where a, a big bond issuance isn't necessary and maybe it's a short term loan um, with a bank um, or we've seen another entity use a county treasury pool um, or there's also facilities to um, just have an interim borrowing program where you draw on a line of credit as needed and then take out that interim uh, loan or borrowing with a long-term issuance. So just a, a couple things as, as we work with issuers uh, in, in thinking about borrowing and how much to borrow and when to borrow. And first and foremost, your borrowing will be driven by your expenditure requirements. Um, and that really drives the amount and the timing. So as your regional projects start taking shape um, and the bar and this expenditure needs hit a peak that typically warrants uh, a bond issuance. Um, those projects actually in order to issue a bond 
really need to have uh, evidence of CEQA compliance as well as the re related permitting in place. Um, and then there's also tax law. So uh, an entity like RTC would be issuing tax exempt bonds. And in that case, tax law requires uh, that after issuing bonds, that the expenditure of those bond proceeds take place over a three year period. So we can't issue bonds and having those proceeds sitting around uh, for, for a long while. We need to have the projects ready to spend the proceeds. Um, the term of your borrowing will really be driven by two things. First is Measure D. You can't issue bonds with a term beyond the term of your tax uh, because those revenues serve as the security of your borrowing. And the second, again, is uh, our friends at the IRS. Uh, they like to know that your borrowing will not ex exceed the useful life of your project. With larger scale transportation projects, that tends not to, to be an issue. Uh, and then the timing of borrowing, as you'd, we saw in the previous uh, example of the cash flow model, it tends to be that issuers like yourselves will sequence transactions um, that really meet the timing needs of certain projects. So it's likely that you wouldn't just do one bond, you could do a couple over a period of, of you know, seven to 10 years. And then your ability to bond and the amount of uh, your bonding is really, um, is, will be constrained by your tax. And um, your tax, at, at the time of issuing bonds, you'll need to, uh, will need to show to the market that your tax will be sufficient to support the obligation to pay debt service. And we look at the tax within the year your bonds are issued. So your strategic plan will forecast growth over time, a growth of revenues, um, and we'll use that for planning purposes. But when we issue a bond, we really look at your actual sales tax revenues in the year the bonds are issued. We'll also need to look at debt service coverage, so how much Measure D revenues are available to support the ongoing debt service on the bonds. And typically, we need to show that there'll be revenues over one times that of the debt service. Uh, so usually, you know, if you had um, one and a half million of annual sales tax dollars, your debt service would, could not exceed that amount. Um, and, and typically it would be lower, uh, for example, uh, closer to a million. And then interest rates at the time of issuing bonds will also drive your capacity. In a higher interest rate environment, you have lower bonding capacity. Um, David will get into this a little bit more when we're talking about local agency tools and options, but just a, a brief snapshot of the security pledge and the, um, the RTC as the local transportation authority as the entity who um, is able to leverage the Measure D tax. So that's the California Department, upon issuing um, the bonds, the California Department of uh, Tax and Administration will then direct the Measure D revenues to the bond trustee. And the bond trustee will pay the debt service payments before allocating the revenues back to the RTC. So after issuing bonds, um, the, after the authority would issue bonds, those revenues, um, the bondholders have first claim on revenues uh, before the revenues coming back to the authority for use on pay-go projects or direct allocation um, funding programs. Uh, and then this uh, slide 13 just kind of puts numbers around bonding capacity, it's in size and constraints, and this coverage. Um, and, the, and the first is coverage within uh, the, the regional program. So again, the, the notion of staying in your own lane uh, and making sure that if the regional program issued bonds for a specific project, 
uh, that the debt service uh, would be supported by the regional program allocation. So for example, in fiscal 18, measure D revenues were just slightly above 20 million. Uh, and if we were to say allocate all of the regional program share um, to support annual debt service, that would be approximately 10 million. So the regional program could support a borrowing um, within its cash flow such that the annual debt service was approximately uh, 10 million annually. Um, the, this, oops, let's go, oops, this way, oh, sorry, I was gonna go back a page, but. <laughs> Yeah, oops, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, sorry about that. This one is what, this is the legal uh, water flow. So this is where um, all of this is how bondholders and rating agencies look at a bond issuance. So all of the Measure D revenues then would support debt service to achieve uh, a debt service coverage ratio. So if we go back uh, here, uh, the second box shows that assuming fiscal 18 revenues uh, of just over 20 million, uh, and um, if the regional program uh, had the annual debt service of 10 million using um, the 20 million over the 10 million, your, your legal coverage is two times. So bonds are sized first and foremost to stay within the debt service can be supported by its specific program area, but then there's a legal coverage requirement such that all revenues, um, the coverage is based on all revenues of the authority. David. Okay, you're all experts on bonding now, I see. So congratulations. Questions now, or you wait to the end? I'd say wait till the end of the presentation. Yeah, and you're going to hear more about bonding. We're happy to answer questions today, and you'll, we're going to review these concepts multiple times before you ever issue a bond. I'll just add one comment to what Melissa said, and then I'm going to move on to the local bonding. But uh, the reason why debt service coverage is so important is that sales tax are volatile, as you saw. So if you issue a bond today, and next year we have the big recession, and sales taxes decline, uh, the investor can only look to the sales taxes for security, and you are not in a position to increase sales taxes. You can't go out without another vote and just get more money. So uh, obviously from an investor point of view, if you're lending money, you want to make sure there's a cushion there. So if debt service is X, you want X plus Y in terms of revenue, so that if there is volatility and there's a dip, and there have been some significant dips at, at various points, 10, 20% over one or two years, that there's still adequate money there to pay the bond. And that's the whole idea of, of coverage. Uh, and it's gonna become important when we talk about bonding at the local level, uh, because of the, the, the different uh, amounts of coverage that might be needed for that as well. Uh, but that's the whole idea is that there's financial, you know, there's cushion when you issue the bond to protect the investor because this is not a situation like a county or a city uh, wastewater enterprise or water enterprise where you can raise rates and generate more revenue the next year if there's a, a dip in uh, delivery of, of water supplies as an example. So that's one point I wanted to make. Um, yeah, I know there's going to be some questions about all that bonding, and, and we'll get to it. The other thing I just want to reiterate that, that Melissa mentioned is this idea that money needs to be expended within three years, generally. Uh, there's got to be, when you, when you borrow it, you, in order to use the tax exemption, which is favorable, uh, there's an expectation that you have projects that are ready and that the money will be spent in three years, which is why often there's multiple bonds that need to be issued, as she mentioned, over the course of 10 years uh, or, or a longer-term program. Um, Okay, so what I wanted to do now is sort of, we've talked about bonding at the regional level, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about bonding uh, at the local level. And before I get into these slides, uh, just a comment about why. Why would you, why was this even a topic? For many, many years, uh, I would say there wasn't a lot of interest in this topic. 
most uh, programs where there was a pass through or a direct allocation, that's not uncommon, um, the local agencies did not use bonding because they really needed the money for road maintenance uh, on an annual basis. And so the money would come in annually so that if they bonded for a bigger project, they wouldn't have the sales taxes available uh, annually because they'd be going to pay off the bond. So that was sort of the traditional working model. And, and it still probably is for a majority of agencies. But recently, we've definitely seen more interest in this. I, I think it's for a couple of reasons. One is the obvious backlog of, of road maintenance projects that uh, have accumulated over a dearth of funding availability for many, many years. I think that's one. I think, two, now with SB1, there is more money you know, around coming to cities and, and un the unincorporated uh, area of the county to uh, address uh, maintenance issues. And so maybe that frees up a little bit more flexibility to use other monies like the, the self-help sales tax to tackle some of your larger projects at the local level. Uh, so there's probably interest there. And then, of course, uh, Melissa talked on page seven uh, about some of the reasons for bonding, minimizing construction cost growth. If, if you're seeing large escalations and inflation on the construction side, you want to get projects delivered now, uh, then that's a reasonable um, you know, tool using a bond to accelerate the delivery before those costs go up. Keep in mind, of course, that there is a cost to borrowing as well. There's an interest cost. And so if those two were a wash, if your construction costs and your interest costs were a wash, you're not necessarily saving money by issuing the bond. You're still delivering the project sooner, which might be an important policy objective, uh, but it may not be economic. On the other hand, if you know inflation uh, on construction is going up at 7 10% a year and the cost of borrowing is at 3%, uh, then obviously uh, there might be an economic benefit to bonding. So those are all the, the trade-offs. But, but bonding isn't free. It's just something we all need to keep in mind. And so every dollar that goes to pay off interest on a bond is $1 less for project costs out of your sales taxes. And sales taxes will be a finite amount. So uh, we believe bonding is really an important tool, but we try and minimize it as well. Uh, as, as Melissa mentioned earlier, we want to optimize the amount of dollars that you can use just straight up pay as you go, because there's no cost to those dollars, and then the amount of, of bond proceeds. And so every strategic plan at the regional level, and I'm sure your own plans, when you put your local hats on, uh, will do the same, optimizing dollars for paygo versus dollars for um, debt service. Okay. With that said, let's talk about local agency options to accelerate the delivery of these direct allocation projects and against your direct allocation shares. So Melissa made a one really important point, well, among many, and that is that uh, under the Measure D ordinance, it's really only the RTC in their role as the local transportation authority that has the uh, authorization, the legal authorization to issue sales tax revenue bonds secured by Measure D. So per the ordinance, uh, only this agency can issue bonds, sales tax revenue bonds, secured by the sales taxes, okay? And that's typically for regional projects, though the authority can issue for local projects as well. We're going to talk about that. But that does not mean that local agencies, cities, and the county have no tools available to them to issue bonds and, and to accelerate their delivery of projects with the sales taxes. It just means they can't use that tool. But there are other tools that can be used, and we're going to talk first uh, about those, and then I'm going to talk about how you also could come together through the authority and have the authority be the issuer of bonds. But the tools, the first tool I want to talk about briefly is inter-program loans. That's one tool that doesn't involve bonding and, and may be appropriate for a smaller shorter term uh, need uh, by an agency that's maybe too small to bond. It's not worth the cost, the overhead, the administrative hassle of issuing a bond. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about these options I mentioned for the local agencies to issue some sort of bond. It's not the same bond that the authority can issue. And then finally, the sales tax revenue bond, which can be issued by the authority, and it could be issued on behalf of local agencies using the direct allocation share as the security for the debt service. So those are the three buckets of, of local agency options. Um, 
This first uh, is the interprogram loan. We know that the expenditure, excuse me, the expenditure plan sets forth various program areas, um, some of which may have projects that are ready to roll and some which don't. So there's, as you can imagine, hey, if I'm ready to go and you're not, let's, let's cut a deal. Yeah, let, me, let me borrow a little bit of your share, uh, deliver my project over the next three to five years, and then I'll pay you back from my share over time. That's doable, it has been done. It may be uh, more likely that a local agency uh, that has a shovel-ready project is going to borrow from the regional project that uh, allocation, because the regional projects may have a longer-term horizon through CEQA and planning and getting uh, matching funds, and so some of that money just may be accumulating, and that may make more sense than doing uh, inter-program loans from each of you. But this is all possible. It's one of the areas where I believe we want to work with staff and your board to develop some policies. When would inter-program loans be permissible? At what interest rate would the borrowing be repaid back? Would there be the ability, if it's a borrowing from a regional program, for the RTC to you know, directly intercept the funds of the local agency that borrowed the money to repay the loan. All of these things, I think, are important. Um, considerations we've listed, I just mentioned most of those, the interest rate, you know, timing and flexibility constraints. Obviously, we don't want to impinge another uh, program's uh, ability to deliver their projects. And so, what kinds of protections are we going to apply to ensure the overall equity of the program allocation? So we can address inter-program loans in the, uh, in the policy section of the strategic implementation plan, and we can have a conversation around that. Uh, and we did that in Sonoma, and we have some policies from Sonoma that we can use as a starting point, but there's others as well. Okay? All right. Um, so now we move on to the idea of local agency bonds. So these would be bonds that are issued by a city or the county, um, um, not by the authority. And so what I've said here is that local agencies can, basically there's two types of bonds that you could issue. And I don't want to go too far into the weeds here, but I'll keep it at the high level. First, and many of you are probably familiar with this, are general fund-backed obligations, a lease revenue bond, bond or a certificate of participation. So every city and the county has the authority under the state constitution uh, and under governing law to enter into leases and to enter into contingent obligations, which is what a lease bond is, uh, to fund projects. And so what one could do is issue a COP uh, for X millions of dollars, sized carefully so that your share of the direct allocation dollars would be adequate to pay that debt service. So you wouldn't have to impinge on other monies of your general fund to pay that debt service. Keep in mind, you would be taking the risk, however, if the sales tax is declined, the general fund is still on the hook to make that debt service, so you probably would want to size a little of your own coverage or your own cushion into that bond to make sure that if there was a decline, you're not dipping into other uh, of your general fund sources of revenue. But this is totally something you can do, and it's not technically secured by the sales tax revenue bond. It's just you're going to get whatever amount of money you get from your direct allocation, and, and you size your bond carefully enough to um, allow you to be comfortable that the revenues will be there to make the debt service. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons. One of the cons, if you will, of a COP or a lease revenue bond is you need to have a piece of real property. You are leasing a piece of real property, uh, an administration center, city hall, jail, courthouse, you know, uh, uh, fire station, all of these are, are real property. Water treatment plant, very good. So uh, I think some of you are familiar with this tool already, but that can be done. And I've worked, I've been in front of many city and county councils and boards talking about this tool. And we'd be happy to talk to your councils and boards if necessary. Okay, so that's step one is, is a COP. You might say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to pledge the general fund. Is there anything I can do to not pledge the general fund but I know, but, but, but issue it at the local level, not through the authority. Um, yes, there is a tool that we call an installment purchase revenue bond or an installment purchase revenue cop, uh, which could be structured so it's secured solely by your direct allocation revenues. Let's just say your agency is getting a million dollars a year on direct allocation. You think, you obviously don't know because of growth and volatility, you don't know but you think you're getting this amount of money, you could structure a bond 
uh, that pledges your share. Okay, that's not technically a sales tax revenue bond, which again, only the authority has the authority to issue, uh, or the commission, but, um, but could be secured by your share. Of course, the market is going to require that same cushion, if not more, that they would require of an authority issued regional bond. So if you're getting a million dollars a year, you probably only want to have debt service that's, you know, six, seven hundred thousand a year so that there's a cushion in case your share drops, there's still money there because there's no general fund pledge behind it. That's one point. The second point is if you remember back on Melissa's slide with that waterfall, when the authority, which is you, <laughs> obviously in your hat as the authority, issues a bond for the regional program, all of the revenues are pledged to the investor, okay? Now, we would size that bond carefully, as Melissa said, just to the regional program share of revenue. So if the regional program, again, gets 50% of the revenue, we wouldn't size the debt service to more than 50%. But the investor knows that all of the revenues are there, for the, are there to repay the bond. Um, so effectively, any bond that is issued at the local level, secured by your share through this installment purchase revenue cost, is effectively a subordinate bond to any bonds that are issued by the authority. That's not prohibitive. It doesn't mean it can't be done. There might be a slightly higher cost of funds, uh, and, and it needs to be coordinated with the regional level. The disclosure to the market is super important. It needs to indicate to the market that this is not an authority bond, that it's effectively subordinate. And this is important. We saw this at TAMC. We're the advisor to TAMC in Monterey. I think the city of Salinas was issuing a local installment purchase revenue cop. They shared the documents with staff at TAMSI. They shared it with us. The disclosure was not appropriate. We got on the phone with the underwriter, with the bond council. They, of course, agreed once we pointed out why. And they had to really change their rating presentation, their official statement. Uh, it affected their rating, not terribly, but it was important to be clear the priority of revenue. So, I believe at the end we're gonna talk about policies. Any, any type of issuance at a local level uh, that doesn't involve the authority should at least be coordinated with authority, include the authority staff, make sure that we and any lawyers that work for the authority are at least you know, working cooperatively to make sure that we don't trip over each other and do something which um, would impinge or run counter to the, to the ordinance. So I've sort of laid out the two, the two ideas. Why a cop? versus an installment uh, purchase revenue bond. A, a general fund cop, we talked about the negatives, pledge of the general fund, pledge of real property. The, 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 the positive on it is that you could issue more. You could issue at one times coverage. If you're bringing in a million dollars a year, you think you could issue a bond secured, you know, with a million, size to a million dollars a year of debt service because the general fund's taking the risk that revenues might drop. So that's one reason why you might think about that tool versus a different tool, you have more bonding capacity. On the other hand, uh, the installment purchase revenue cop, the, the, the positive there, of course, is that it would, um, it, it would be secured only by, the, by your share of revenues. And therefore, you're going to have to build more cushion in. Um, so that's the, the positive and the negative. Um, so it's doable. Yeah, with some coordination and, and, and the appropriate uh, approach to education and disclosure. Uh, third, and finally, what about bonds that the authority issues, but on behalf of direct allocation projects? Melissa talked a lot about authority-issued bonds for the regional projects, which are very important, and I presume uh, that'll be the focus of the strategic plan. But each of your agencies working with your public works directors and your own governing boards will be talking about whether you want a bond or not. So um, let me just talk for a minute about that and then I'll wrap and you can ask your questions. Um, if the commission were to issue sales tax bonds on behalf of the direct allocation programs, there are a couple of important considerations. One, we might run out of coverage for the authority-wide project. If every single agency were to come and say, hey, yeah, we want a bond against our share, which is unlikely, I'll grant you that, but it's possible. If each of you, if each of your government entities said, yeah, we want a bond, and so the authority said, okay, well, let's look at that. We know we want a bond for some regional projects, and we want a bond for each of the local projects, and we generally want to get a good rating and a good interest rate, and so we need to have some cushion. There isn't enough cushion to go around 
possibly, and still get to the level of cushion we think would get you the highest rating. Let's just say 1.5 times coverage. In this box, uh, this is a, a variation on Melissa's boxes. Here you got the 20 million a year. We're just you know saying the F, uh, let's just say those are the revenues at the time you issue your bond. Your regional program allocation, let's just say you bonded against the full regional, that's 10 million of debt service. Let's just say you, you bonded against the full city county direct allocation share, which is about 27%. Uh, so that's another five and a half million. So you're up above 15 million of annual debt service against 20 million of revenues. So now your overall coverage is down to 1.3 times instead of say 1.5 times. It's just an illustrative model. There's still coverage there because there's some other programs like transit and, and bike ped and other things that aren't being bonded against in this example. So we just have to be more careful if that's the approach and adopt some policies about how the locals could issue bonds through the authority. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second, uh, what those policies are. So it's doable uh, and it, it, it may make sense to do that also at the same time that the authority is issuing bonds for the regional project to, to uh, achieve some economies of scale, not duplicate costs of issuance, save some money basically for everybody involved. So this slide, it's a little messy. Uh, we've really talked about it all, but pros and cons, you can take this with you. Uh, you can call us and ask us questions later if, if you have them uh, with your various staffs. But we've laid out some pros and cons for each of the three options. We've got the general fund lease, which uh, presumably gives you greater bonding capacity and maybe a lower interest cost depending on the rating of your general fund. Um, but it pledges the general fund and ties up an asset pro and con, the local agency installment purchase cop, uh, protects the general fund, no need for an asset, uh, but probably a new credit, so a little bit more work involved in establishing the credit, it's more complicated credit, it's gonna probably have a lower rating, a higher interest cost because it is effectively a subordinate obligation to authority bonds, and you'll have lower bonding capacity because you need to build in that financial cushion. And then finally, the authority issued bond that we talked about also protecting the general fund and, and not requiring an asset and could have economies of scale when you do it all together with the authority bond. Uh, but those probably, on a policy basis, we'd probably say the best course of action is to say, yeah, the authority can issue bonds for the, for the direct allocation share, but maybe those should be on a subordinate basis to any authority issued bonds for regional projects. And so there's still maybe a little bonding capacity constraint there and a possibly slightly higher cost of funds uh, as a result of you know, the subordinate lien. Uh, though, of course, interest rates are super low right now, so even at a subordinate lien, that might still be super uh, cost effective. So I'm gonna finish this last page, sorry I'm going so long, uh, page 20. Uh, these are some of the policies that we might consider working with staff and your board, uh, ultimately around local agency bonding. Clearly local agency bonding should be coordinated with staff at a minimum uh, through the evaluation and implementation stages. Um, and inter-program loans, of course, necessarily involve the authority. We need to develop some policies around inter-program loans. When, how much, how does it get repaid? Uh, bonds issued by the authority themselves, um, we would need to just dis discuss how to preserve the coverage for all players, especially for the regional program. So we might require uh, debt service coverage for the local programs or subordinate liens, et cetera. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we probably wanna talk about installment purchase revenue cops issued by the city or the county, uh, making clear that they're gonna have a subordinate claim on sales taxes generally, and that needs to be uh, disclosed appropriately in the, in the various disclosure documents. So I'm gonna end there. I know it was a mouthful, uh, but I hope you found this helpful, and Melissa and I are both available for questions. Thank you, David and Melissa, and I'm sure you stimulated some questions. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with uh, Commissioner uh, McPherson here. Yeah, thank you for your detailed presentation. Sure. Very uh, well understood, as best it can be. Good, and uh, first of all, I wanna thank the voters of Santa Cruz County for approving Measure D, we wouldn't be having this discussion if you wouldn't have uh, approved that by more than a two-thirds margin. So thank you, each and every one of you. Um, the, uh, on the first page there, it, it had, it, well, in Measure D, it, it said that 30% um, uh, would go to local roads. But, and you, I've seen that the, uh, the neighborhood projects include the, um, there's 27% and then there's 3% uh, for neighborhood projects, Highway 9 and Highway 17. So those are the two specified but that's where that 30% is made up. I wanna make that clear 
because uh, I know that was an important, uh, when we were on the campaign, the, the biggest percentage is going to go to local roads, and so th those are inclusive in that. Uh, yes. So I d that's just for me to clear my conscience, I guess. Yeah, well, but, that's um, our understanding <laughs> as well. And another thing that uh, we, uh, we really pushed is that Santa Cruz County would be one of a few in, in the state, I believe now, of, to be a self-help county. Okay. And um, that means that the state recognizes you're helping yourself with your transportation issues, so we will put a, a line item in here for self-help counties. And as I remember, it was uh, two or $300 million total. Um, and for this county, I think it was going to be in the neighborhood of about two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Is that Guy, is that about right? With the so I think you're talking about a portion of uh, Senate Bill One, which is the local partnership program funding, and that was um, put into uh, Senate Bill One to be an incentive for um, local entities to tax themselves. So there's been a lot of debate on that program recently. Um, Right now, um, and the previous cycle of programming, 50% uh, of it was uh, done by formula, and we were receiving about 300000 a year. And then the other 50% was um, competitive. Um, there's been some discussion about changing that <laughs> to provide more by formula as opposed to um, by co um, competitive basis. Um, I've actually been trying to um, push more for competitive because smaller counties can't do a lot with $300,000 a year when you're talking about some very, very large projects. Um, and we're working on a compromise that would um, provide a higher percentage by formula, but um, a, uh, a special bucket for smaller counties to compete for. And we think that overall that would actually provide opportunities to bring more money to the region. Thank you. I, thank you for your effort, and I think we uh, to continue pushing and pressing for that. Um, and it's just another benefit of Measure D. And I just want to uh, assure the voters also that included in that is an oversight committee, so we, we have a, an updated uh, annual report of how we're spending our money, so people can be assured that we're doing what we said we'd do. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rodkin. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've been in local government and regional groups like this for over 30 years. That's the clearest presentation, <laughs> really, on, on how bonds work and what the considerations are I've heard all that time. Great, thank you. Um, and I don't want my questions to sound like I'm against doing bonding. They may end up sounding like that's not the point, because if it weren't for bonding, the city of Santa Cruz wouldn't have a water treatment plant, a sewage treatment plant, our roads wouldn't be paved. They all depended on bonding that we've done over the years. So my first question is, can you give, you, you, did I understand correctly that the cushion you need generally for the bond market is about 1.5, um, in other words, like in effect 150%, you need to- yeah, It's you, like you a third that. extra, it's a third extra. I mean, that's, that's a working assumption. Uh, one thing to note, sales tax revenue bonds are viewed favorably by the market. It's a good credit. Um, and the ratings that you get, the higher the rating, the lower the interest cost, right? The, the lower the borrowing cost. And so the higher the coverage factor, uh, that will impact a, a higher rating. So um, 1.5 we think is consistent with a sort of double A category rating. It's a very positive rating. It could be done, a bond could be done at a lower coverage, maybe one and a quarter, but it wouldn't be as favorable. So what we see here uh, is that since on a regional basis, you're only gonna bond against 50% at most, and probably not even that, but at most. So effectively, there's two times coverage for the regional bond. Right. So there's no reason to drop down to 1.25 and get a lower rating. At the local level, then we start to look at what are the trade-offs, maybe a lower rating is better because you get more money, we could talk about it. But yes, that's our working assumption. And Again, for the general public about this, uh, when you think of a recession, most people are thinking there's nothing. The bottom dropped out. Yeah. But in fact, this is a, the 1.5 number or something is on the level of the worst recessions, even like the five-year one we just had recently. Yeah. They don't take more than 50 percent of the, no. the definitely not. tax money. Yeah. 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 I mean, we've seen 10, 20 percent declines. But can you give us a, a ballpark figure for what the uh, borrowing costs are for a bond? In other words, including the setup, you know, establishing the bond, and as well as the interest rate you're paying. What what percentage of the money that you're getting from Measure D? Let's say, for the sake of argument, we bonded 50% of it. I'm yeah, not going to do big that. Big number. 
like what what would what percentage of that would be going to answer yeah. that one? Yeah, I I'm really say, wrong. I'm my technical really expert ball ball. answer that one. <laughs> Put well, her on the spot. Your term of the tax is 30 years, and remember the tax has been going now for a couple years. So let's for the moment assume you're going to issue 25 year bonds. Uh, just yesterday we were in the market with approximately a 25 year issuance. Uh, and it was high, um, high A, low double A rated, and the interest rate, the all-in cost of borrowing on that was 3.06%. So we're at an incredibly low interest rates right now. Um, for planning purposes, we often use a, a higher uh, estimate for debt service costs. And then you want to talk just briefly about the cost of issuance, the actual uh, consultant costs, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, so your your cost of issuance is one um, payments to consultants, advisors uh, in the form of municipal advisors and legal advisors, and then just uh, ancillary costs, bond trustees and rating, uh, agencies. rating agencies. Uh, and then there's also a payment to an underwriter, whether they're purchasing your bond or negotiating the sale of the bond, and that's in the form of an what is called an underwriter's discount. And that tends to be paid on a dollar per bond basis. So if you have a bigger offering, you have a larger payment uh, to the underwriter, whereas the consultant fees are just fixed fees. Um, and on any given transaction, they end mm -hmm. anywhere, yeah, pro on average, 300000 in terms of all of the consultant fees. One last question. Um, If we were to issue a bond for the uh, city of Watsonville, um, and the, we talked about this, for their, for that was going to be based primarily on their share that they were guaranteed by the formula that, were, that we worked out. But uh, in the end, we're going to, it's not going to be their general fund, but we're going to take the, the ultimate responsibility if things go badly and so forth. Um, Sorry, who's we? The, the authority, the, the, the RTC. And it, so, we're putting the entire uh, three, um, uh, 500 million bucks sure. you know, at, at risk, even though, again, I don't think it's all at risk, but legally it is. Yes. Um, how often are, are general authorities willing to do that for local governments? I'm trying to get some sense of whether that would be like <laughs> extremely generous and never heard of before or something that's done every day. I, I don't have any idea about that. Yeah, I, I, yeah we haven't, I haven't seen it done very often. I saw it in Napa County when they had a flood tax and we were the advisor and we, were, we did allow bonding against some local shares, but we, in, uh, we had a policy adopted by the, uh, it was a, Flood Protection Authority, that the bonds be on a subordinate lien basis to any bonds by the regional uh, issued at the regional level. So that, I guess the answer is it wouldn't be done without protections for the priority project at the regional level and the bonding ability at the, at the, at the regional level and protections for other local agencies. Because you're right, you're pledging everybody else's share as well. So there would have to be a sizable coverage factor to really protect against uh, declines in revenues, uh, I think is the way it would work. But, but, but as Melissa said, that's the only occasion I can think of it. And if, if the bondholders are, we're, they're, we're being put, they're being put in second or third position for getting yes. the money if everything falls apart, yes. um, they're gonna want a higher interest rate on their yeah. bonds, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Those are my questions. Thank, yeah, that was a really excellent Good. You seem like you understand it well. Commissioner Cap. You bet. Uh, actually, I won't repeat a lot of that. Uh, the interest rate and, er and everything and how much we pay, is, is there an actual figure like 5%, 7%, kind of like a home loan or whatever like that is? Is there a, is there a percentage? Is, is it 20%? Yeah, for the, for the interest rate, uh, as Melissa said on this recent deal we did, it was 3% for 25 year money in the current market for a reasonably yeah. well-rated mm -hmm. entity. So again, by time you're ready to issue, it could be a year from now, it could be two years from now, we'll see where rates go. We're at a historically low level, but I've been saying we were at a historically low level for about five years and, and we're still there. And all of the events that are happening nationally and internationally seem to be keeping uh, interest rates low, uh, given all of the volatility. Mm -hmm.
Okay, and then uh, I know you're the messengers and all that. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, the Measure D money, we're, we're spending how much on consulting with uh, KNN? Right now, we, uh, to assist in the strategic planning process, we charge on an hourly basis. Uh, our rates are in the 300 to three and a quarter an hour for the two of us, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and so it's a time and materials basis at the moment. If we were to assist you in a bond transaction, our typical approach is a fixed transaction fee, which gets paid, you know, from the bond proceeds, you know, typically in the range of you know, hundred thousand dollars or less, some something in that level. Sure. Yeah. And uh, the reasoning, I guess, for the bonds is uh, uh, when when Measure D was passed, that was before now, the uh, federal highway money that's being withheld, uh, you know, for the freeways that affects uh, Caltrans and it affects us. Pro approximately about eight million, probably or, or more, in uh, Santa Cruz County, that we had expended, that we had spent on emergency repairs. So the public, I guess, that asked me, they they expect that once Measure D passed, that we were going to be shovel ready and be able to go uh, full bore, because we were going to use leverage and uh, matching funds from the state or federal. Uh, Somehow we're we're not hearing that, uh, and that that's my concern. What what I'm seeing here is, I th the money that we're bringing in and bringing in for Measure D should be for leverage and also matching funds from the state and Fed. Mm -hmm. And then if we're not getting it, we're going down a path of borrowing and borrowing with this money. So, um, am, am I mistaken? It's kind of depressing in a way. Somebody have an answer? I think it's reasonable where we are. Yeah, uh, remember we passed Measure D because we could not count on revenues from the state and federal government. And so we wanted to become a self-help county right. so we would have access to funds. And what we are talking about in this presentation is to leverage these funds to potentially accelerate um, the, uh, the, uh, the use of the money to do the projects now rather than waiting to do them all over a 30-year period. And what is being presented here is options for how that could be done. We, in the end, will be the choose whether we want to do that acceleration um, and at what level and for what kind of projects. Uh, but there will be policies. But Measure D, without a doubt, provides uh, in, uh, critical resources for us to do road repair on projects that we're doing now. At, we, in the county of Santa Cruz, the, we're going to be having $2.9 million in this year's budget uh, on road repair that we did not have prior to the passage of, of uh, Measure D. And that rep represents uh, probably a twofold increase on what we were spending on roads um, in, in 2016. So it's a big increase. And now we're just figuring out how to potentially borrow off of it in the future to get the projects done sooner. Okay, and uh, I guess that's my, my point. Uh, uh, maybe I'm the only one mistaken here, is if we have like 2.5 or 3 million coming in in a year, are we getting uh, matching funds or is the leverage getting us another, uh, let's say 2.5 or 3 million from the state or federal government? Because that's, that's what the public I, that I talk to is looking at. Are we actually getting that matching funds or leverage that we were talking about? We are eligible for additional funds from the state. As, the, as our director just pointed out, there's a, there's a discussion about how much is going to be by formula and how much will be in competition. Uh, those of us who campaigned in favor of Measure D uh, understood that when we were out talking to the public that we were going to be able to use this money as leverage and that we would be able to access additional funds. Right. And have we re received any leverage money? So we're um, in the first cycle of the SB1 program, which is really our best opportunity to leverage funds. We didn't have a lot of regional projects ready. Now, I'm speaking mainly about regional projects because those are projects that I have control over and that I can ap actually submit applications for. Um, local jurisdictions can certainly um, submit their own applications for, for leveraging funds, too. Um, I don't think it's an either-or situation where we're looking at bonding and paying for the project versus asking for grant money to pay for the project. I think it's a combination of both, and there's a sweet spot that we have to kind of reach. It takes a while to get projects, big 
projects ready for construction. Um, sometimes it can take five to ten years to get a big highway project ready for construction. There's a planning phase, there's an environmental phase, there's the need to acquire right away <coughs> and to do final design before you get to construction and then you actually have to construct the project. One of the things that KNN clearly um, emphasized today is the need to have CEQA clearance before you can issue bonds. So I'm trying to get as many projects out with PAYGO capacity to get environmental clearance. So that would be now putting me in position to bond. I'm going to be looking at the horizon saying, can these projects expend these funds in three years? And then I'm going to try to see what my need is. How much money do I need? Should it all come from grants? or should it come from a combination of the measure funds and the grant funds? The grant funding uh, application process and the guidelines are still being formulated, but what I've seen is a desire to have teeth in the game, for us to put some of our money on it so they'll put more of their money on it. So we're going to be doing a, an analysis as we put together the strategic plan to say, where's our sweet spot? Should we put 10 million of bond money on this project for construction and asked for 30 from the solutions to congested corridor pod, and that would be a fully funded project. Do we think that that will compete well and give us the best opportunity to get the grant? I could say, well, I'm not going to put any of my measure money on it. I'm going to go for all the grant funds, but that could be risky. I may not get the grant funds. So it's going to, going to be a combination of looking at all of our opportunities, but we're too early in the game to really um, measure what we've obtained thus far. Cycle two of solutions to congested corridors is coming towards the end of this year. That's why I'm working hardly. That's why KNN is here today. We're trying to get ourselves in the best position to leverage funds by using a combination of Measure D and grant funds. And I, you know, I appreciate that. I, I that kind of makes it clear. It is risky. What we're doing here is we got to be very careful. I, I just, I want to see us spend the mon money wisely and, and, and actually be shovel ready and get projects moving, actually. Uh, I, I, the only concern I have is I hope uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, we don't have to try to pass a tax to pay off the debt from our tax, our debt uh, from Measure D. I want us to spend the money wisely and not have this debt that we're going to have to pass another bond or, or pass another, you know. Thank measure. you for those comments. Thanks. Yeah, what we're trying to do today, Greg, is we're trying to get an understanding of how bonds work. And, okay. and, and, this, and is, this is a lesson for all of us on how bonds work. We're not spending any money today. Sure. We're just taking the time to get educated on bonds. So, uh, Commissioner Dillis. Yes, uh, thank you for the great presentation also. Um, I have a few questions. Sure. First, um, does the, uh, uh, do we, already have a um, reserve policy and a, uh, a debt policy that you'll be building upon. Um, does the RTC have such those documents? Yeah, do you know? so, so we don't be on what's in the measure itself, and that's one of the strategic implementation plan is to put that actually in policy and give you guys an opportunity to decide how you guys want to uh, approach financing for these projects. I also want to emphasize, too, because there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, the economy turning downward and how much risk we're taking. When I was at Sonoma, we issued our first uh, revenue bonds in 2008, right about at the beginning of the recession. We did fine. We continued to deliver um, environmental documents. We didn't slow down. We watched interest rates go down. We watched um, the cost of labor go down, and we were actually able to deliver more projects by bonding. We never had an issue with coverage. We had great coverage and safeguards put in. We had a debt reserve fund as one of our policies. Um, we don't want that to be too high because that limits your ability to deliver projects and that's money just sitting in the bank and there's also additional insurances that you can take out to ensure that you, know, you don't get yourself in trouble. But we got through the Great Recession delivering most of our projects and being able to pay our debt service. And uh, my next question, um, thanks for addressing the recession issue, because obviously that they come and go, and when you're looking at long-term trends, I recognize you've seen that. Um, but I'm wondering about the maybe the, the more recent trend of brick and mortar, and what that, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you know, long-term, is that a real issue for us in terms of security for bonds that we might issue? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah. 
So you're talking about brick and mortar sales tax revenues versus on the movement to online. Right, and sales. and so yeah, that overall, th you're right. A lot of it's just shifted to online, um, but because of that, uh, it may not. We may not get the sales taxes here in our locality, depending on I guess where it's where it's coming from. But um, any thoughts on that general trend and how it may affect our long-term sales tax trend? Yeah, I was just gonna. Yeah, there, there was a recent, uh, was it late 2018 yeah. um, uh, ruling? It's a Wayfair decision with regard to the collection of sales tax revenues uh, from online purchases. Uh, so the the hope is that um, while some of the online sales tax maybe have escaped the county uh, historically that now that decision will help insulate uh, the sales tax within the county. Um, so as a, if I were a county resident purchasing an item from a vendor online in Oregon, uh, that entity would need to charge uh, the, my local sales tax on that, on that product. And so remit. the, in remit. And so the, the hope is that that decision will help protect uh, the sales tax uh, revenues on a local basis. And it still needs to be administered state by state, I think. Yes. There's a lot more to come on that. But it's an important point. We've been talking about internet sales for a while. You, you know, I, I think ultimately in the strategic implementation plan, you want to be more conservative about your growth assumption. You know, under promise and over deliver is generally a better course than the, than, than the mm -hmm. inverse. <laughs> Spoken like a true finance person. <laughs> um, my, my next question is, um, and I know we're talking about bonds and debt, uh, but we're talking about um, sales taxes and, um, and as being the primary source of how we pay back these bonds. And I'm wondering if we're contemplating a new sales tax. I know there are lots of um, questions out there still about how much we're going to get in grants versus what we're going to get in existing tax. But is that part of the discussion? I'm asking partly because I spoke with the previous executive director, but I'm going to ask you this question about that possibility. And so I just wanted to see if, if we are um, contemplating that, if that's part of the strategic plan that we may need to do a new sales tax. We're contemplating a class on bonds right now is all we're doing. We're not contemplating any additional funds. There's no hidden agenda here. This is pretty much an education on bonding. Thanks. I just want to see it coming. That's all. Okay, great. So my next question. Okay, um, go ahead. Is um, uh, on the COP lease revenue bonds you mentioned, and the fact that security would be real estate for for local jurisdiction. If we were, uh, I'm, I'm from a city, city Scotts Valley. If we were doing our own um, COP, um, I remember way back. Santa Cruz County, when they did some COPs, they actually used the roads themselves as security. I know that's unusual. Is that a possibility, uh, or do we actually literally need a building? Well, you know, that's, uh, we, we've talked about that. It's less than ideal. We don't see it very frequently. It's not considered an essential asset, in a sense, and that's part of the security in a lease. An investor wants to make sure you're not going to walk away from your admin building. You might, what does it mean to even walk away from a road? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it can't be done. You know, it's something we could look at, but it's definitely irregular. Messy, I say a messy. Better, <laughs> better with a parking lot. Yeah, yeah, right. Which, yeah. which might mean a higher interest rate on the bonds if there's some oh, uh, sure complexity. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Okay. And my last question: um, You mentioned alternative ways that we could fund um, for cities, let's say um, um, the sh our share of uh, projects, if we had the money, and, and we don't have a surplus of money, but if we found ourselves with cash um, as a city uh, to cover our share of local project costs, could we uh, yeah. use our own internal borrowing and repay that with the, the, the tax dollars as they come in later, whether they were, uh, have, uh, I guess that may, could come in, I guess either as tax dollars or as bond proceeds, but any issue with paying ourselves back, we funded our own money for, and did a large project all at once? You're asking about holding, holding as a security the money you get from the RTC, is that the question? We're not even going that formally, but just saying um, that if we decided to do a project uh, all at once and it fit the, the definition of what we could spend the money on for our local shares that comes to us, uh, could we use the, the money that comes in later? Um, Are you saying to repay a bond? Pay ourselves back. And well, a, if you use cash for yes, a project, if we use cash, repay that cash department, whether it's a grant. 
Yeah, it's probably simpler if I don't bring the bonds into yeah, it. Yeah, leave the bonds out of it. Because yeah. we just bring the money coming in, so we're, that's probably not a bond issue, but any... I, I think it depends on, uh, as long as it's in, in, it's consistent with the expenditure plan, the ordinance, yeah. right? I, I mean, that's the use use of sales tax right. dollars so is dictated by that. So we with the ordinance. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Those were my questions. And, and I just want to follow up, just to be clear. When we, we didn't get into all the elements of bonding, but bonds can be repaid early uh, after a period of time, and that's a consideration as well. If you have excess dollars, you want to pay off your bonds early, that's a possibility. Thanks for adding that. That may be a future question. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yeah, somewhat that question. Uh, let's see, the bond rating. Let's talk a little bit about that because there's a, an application process in order for us to be able to get rated somehow. Um, I, I don't know the cost, the timing. The, the variance of the rate. Can you discuss that a little bit about applying and getting yourself rated? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and I, I just for my edification, are we talking about for a local agency bond or for the regional bond or just um, generally? Well, it, the discussion is about the regional bond. So yes. let's talk about yeah. this agency as a whole and what that process would look like. So one of the things that the rating agencies rate is an actual deal or a document. So you need documentation. So one wouldn't typically go and get a rating until they're in the process of issuing a bond. The bond issuance process from sort of start to finish is typically four, maybe six months for a first time issuer. So we're a ways away from that, but once uh, the, uh, the legal documents have been prepared, which set forth some of the terms we've talked about, the coverage and the term of the bond and the repayment structure, all of that is set forth in a legal document. Then there is a disclosure document which discloses to the market all of the economy that supports the sales tax and any other risks, any litigation that's happening that might impinge on the tax, the decisions like the Wayfair and other things, uh, all of that goes into a prospectus. At that point, then we go to the rating agency and we say, here's our story. We want to borrow $25 million. It's going to have coverage of at least X. We've got all these legal protections built in and covenants. Here's our economy. Here's our collections history since 2016. Uh, you know, we tell a story, the best story we can, and at that point we get a rating. But would there be, uh, I, I don't know. Cost? Or well, the difference in going out and getting our own rating versus some of the other bond options that are in here. I mean, ah, if we're dealing with, you know, a, quor a half a percent, yeah. a quarter of a percent, is it really important to do, or to go that approach versus another? I don't know cost effective wise, um, right. if it's wise for us to go and spend all of that for whatever the savings may be. Well, I, I guess if I understand the question correctly, if the authority goes for a rating, we expect the rating to be high, given this type of security structure your, uh, and the likelihood of the, the coverage factor that we're talking about. So I think we think in the low double A, something like that is reasonable to expect, perhaps. If the city of Watsonville were to go and issue a local uh, bond secured by just your share of the sales taxes, it very well could be less. You're in a much less economically diverse area. Um, you know, the economy there may be impacted by a recession differently. So, I, so that's one factor that the regional rating is like, could be higher than the local ratings, although you each have your own entities with your own characteristics. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. I might be missing it. Uh, well, I, I think that I'm just th looking yeah. at uh, the regional basis versus um, the local. some of the other terms of the other bond options that were available. It's, it, we, we obviously want to go with the most competitive lowest rate yeah. possible so yeah. we can leverage that as far as we possibly can. And uh, the duration of the bonds, is it necessary that the, we don't have to have the duration of the life of the, the tax either? We no, can of course not. A five-year yeah. bond or a 10-year bond Absolutely. as well. Yeah. And uh, again, no pre payment penalties uh, for payoff early for any reason other than our upfront fees that we won't. Well, so there, I mean, that, you're getting into the details and, and, and your advisor, if you're doing a local bond, you could work with us as an advisor or another firm, certainly. Uh, certain types of publicly sold bonds do have a prepayment penalty. Uh, other types of private placements, maybe with your local bank, might not. That really, you're getting into sort of the, another level of detail. I think if you were to issue bonds through the regional authority, it probably makes sense to try and get a sense of who's interested in issuing and when and try and team up and, and create some efficiencies. You do one issuance, we don't want to do five little issuances and pay all the same fees five times. Duplicate. Yeah, so there's efficiencies, I think, that could be achieved. Thank you. Commissioner Leopold. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks short. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. It was very helpful. Uh, I think my questions are more uh, directed to Mr. Preston. You know, the county uh, faces some unique uh, 
circumstances. When Measure D passed in November of 16, it was before <clears throat> $130 million worth of damage to our infrastructure in, the, in February of 2017. Uh, and now we are faced with a, a federal administration who is making it very hard for us to access uh, federal disaster dollars that we're um, entitled to. And so the idea of bonding off our share is, has gained uh, a, a lot more traction at the county. Um, will the, in your experience in Sonoma County, um, was there bonding on, a, on, on local roads? Did uh, entities uh, bond off of their portion different from everybody else? Um, the locals were asked about their interest in bonding, and they were not interested in bonding. They wanted a steady flow of revenue for maintenance and transit. Um, they also, for their project funds, did not want to bond. Um, the only exception was when SMART, um, the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit, did um, pass their sales tax measure, and um, they did so <coughs> concurrent with passing CEQA for that project, they did bond and we did a combination bond with the regional projects for the highway bucket with the SMART program so they could um, uh, um, repair grade crossings, which was allowed under their bonding. It was a very similar situation with uh, Measure D and the 8% uh, rail preservation. We can do certain preservation projects, but we can't implement rail. When they, they passed their own sales tax measure for, for that and I believe they bonded off of that too. But the, the regional projects, uh, the direct allocation projects for maintenance and transit showed no interest in bonding. Well, I, I think that, that, that it might be different here uh, given the, what, what we, the, just the different circumstances that we have yeah. here. And maybe, the, the, I don't know whether you could answer this or, or they can, um, uh, I'm assuming that we're gonna wanna bond for the regional projects because they may be, they, Th they may be the ones most likely um, um, the a highway project or something like that, which requires a lot of money at one time. Uh, could you bond for a regional project and one jurisdiction uh, together, or do you have do you have to do that separately? Yes, uh, you, you could. I yeah. think the yeah. biggest issue is the the term of the payback and the life of the project. So I know that the highway projects, for example, have 50, 100 year lifespan, no problem bonding over that period of time. So I'd have to know what the projects really are. I mean, if they're really five year maintenance projects and the longest term I can go is seven years, I would have to talk to David yeah. about how could I structure a bond that I want to issue for 30 years with a project that I can only bond for seven. Yeah, there is a relation. That's a really good point. Thank you. There's a relationship requirement under the tax law about the average life of your bonds and the average life of your project and um, useful life. Uh, and they do need to be in relationship. One can be 125% of the other, uh, but not more. Well, uh, j just so that we to get not too deep in the weeds, I feel confident um, the, with our, the leadership. Uh, Mr. Preston has experience in putting together these strategic plans. One of the reasons we hired him is because of that experience and and uh, his presentation to us that that would be useful for a project like ours. And so I feel very uh, confident in, in, in that. Uh, I think we are gonna, uh, unlike the, the previous uh, county, we there's probably gonna be uh, some bonding here. And uh, to be thinking about that as we build a strategic plan will be important and we'll have to have a lot more conversation with our public work staff um, and and our board and everything else to to figure out exactly what we want to do but uh, but I think we should be prepared for that that's why we're here today thank you for the presentation Let's, we'll consider that on the table okay Commissioner Brown thank you um, thank you for the presentation uh, I'll echo Commissioner Rockin's statement about this, although my uh, history of hearing these kinds of presentations is much more limited than his, um, it was really understandable. And, and so I appreciate um, for uh, novices like myself really being able to get into this. I don't think I have any other questions. I think most of them have been answered. I would say um, just to echo the desire to ha find a way to and space to have this conversation about how it is that local jurisdictions who may 
express an interest in bonding. I know at least the county <coughs> has and others may come to, to have that conversation as we proceed. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coonerty? Sure. Um, thank you for your presentation. I look forward to seeing the actual scenarios and then we can really look at the numbers and the trade-offs. But as conceptual, uh, I thought it was helpful to go over this. Um, I will say from my perspective, it's extremely important that uh, local jurisdictions, in this case, particularly the county, have the opportunity to bond. Um, first, uh, interest rates are extremely low and our credit rating is extremely high. Um, we will not be able to borrow money at this, these rates any time in the near future. And so uh, this is an opportunity. And then the most important piece is that um, given the state of our roads, uh, interim repairs can extend the lifespan. And so we can wait uh, for these monies to come in and in five years, every road will cost three times as much to repair. Um, and so the more we can preventative work we can do or interim work we can do, the more money we save. And right now the money is uh, accessible and inexpensive. Um, and so we need to move quickly on this uh, as quickly as we can in order to access these funds, in my opinion. Can I make one follow-up comment to that? Absolutely. Very brief. Just a reminder that all of the considerations we talked about early on on the regional program apply for the local program bonding. So having CEQA ready, having an expectation that you'll expend the money within three years for tax exempt bonds, those are all the same requirements that, that'll help dictate when you're ready, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Mulhern. Yep. Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. And again, uh, Thank you for bringing this. Uh, it's been uh, very educational for me. I'm the novice person over here. Over here. The, everyone's a senior to me. Uh, so this has been really a, an educational process for me. So thank you. Commissioner Rock, do you have a follow-up? One yeah. quick yeah. comment. <laughs> I, I just wanted to respond to a concern that Greg Caput had raised that, um, you know, they're just spending some of the money on interest and setting up the bond and so forth. But I, the, it's not just that you accelerate the projects. They happen sooner and people see them now instead of having to wait 20 years for them to happen. But it's the fact that the construction costs go so consistently up every year. I mean, they go up and down, but over a trend. If you're, if you're paying three to, let's say, even 4% with the initial cost to issue the bond against the fact that if you wait another year for the project, it's going to be 7 to 10% more expensive to do it. That's a, it's a fiscally responsible thing to do as well as giving people something earlier. And so you've got to look at both of those issues, I think. It's not, a trade-off with inflation. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. I think it's kind of critical to address that. If it, if it were just money coming out and people were happier because they got the projects earlier, it might not be fiscally responsible. But we're actually saving money when you spend the money earlier rather than wait, wait and plus the maintenance issue that Ryan raised. Well, Thank that you. was why I asked the uh, interest rate. If the interest rate was, let's say, 10% or something, yeah. then we're losing money. Right. But in this case, we're keeping up with inflation. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open up to the public, see if they have any questions. Anyone from the public like to come up, have a comment, a question? Okay, great. This item was uh, information only, and it was a boatload of information. We appreciate your time for coming here and enlightening us, and I'm sure we'll be having uh, further conversations down the road. Thank you very much. Okay, we go on to item 17. This is the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets <coughs> Corridor Program. Either way, you know, it's probably that's. Uh, yeah, I can go now. Oh, hang on. Commissioner McPherson has a few comments well, before you right. start, so I'm just going to allow him to make those. Yeah, okay. so, uh, um, first of all, I, I just want to frame the conversation on this Highway 9 corridor uh, plan. I, I uh, before we, this is kind of, uh, we usually listen to the presentation, but I just want to get a framework of where we are and who we're working with and the partners that we have in this. And the long haul we have, have taken to get to this point. Um, and I really want to thank everybody for developing this plan. Uh, each of the agencies that are involved really can't be thanked enough. It's been a tremendous cooperative effort, especially from Caltrans. I want to thank you for your funding, their, their funding of this study, inviting all of us to your table to develop uh, this first master plan for transportation for Highway 9. This is going to take a couple minutes, and I just don't want to miss any points because this has been a long haul. Uh, the Regional Transportation Commission staff 
um, Rachel on down or up or whatever, your passion and hard work were evident throughout this process. I can't thank you enough. And the county public works uh, staff uh, has been really very instrumental in getting us to where we are today. And specifically to some uh, San Ramon Valley residents and uh, community groups, in particular, the Boulder Creek Business Association, who we heard from uh, earlier, San Ramon Valley Chamber of Commerce, the Valley Women's Club, and the San Ramon Valley School District. Um, personally, I've been talking with uh, this community since 1913 after first being elected. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> no, 2013, well, I'm getting older, but uh, yeah, so I'm, you, you, you are one of the senior us. members. <laughs> I'm one of the senior members, I know. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, but, uh, and it, early on, uh, Caltrans came along when we had a Metro bus that, uh, and the Metro has been very much involved in this as well, uh, to just look at the, the needs of Highway 9, a special, special avenue that, uh, and it's for serving the San Rosa Valley and all its surrounding uh, residents there. Um, now, after more than two years that uh, Caltrans is, and RTC has taken to uh, develop this, um, we, we, I just want to emphasize the one big theme is safety. Uh, safety for pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, and yes, we've even heard horses this morning. Uh, but after the February accident that took Josh Howard from his family and friends, uh, safety has become an even more profound theme. My thanks go to also uh, Assemblyman uh, Mark Stone, who co-hosted a meeting with me on April 18th with Congressional uh, Congress members Anna Eshoo and Jimmy Panetta uh, present to ask Caltrans, the RTC, and County Public Works uh, what we could do to address these safety concerns. Um, the San Ramon Valley makes up the biggest part of my fifth district and is the only area in the county that has a state highway serving as a main street to four town centers, uh, Felton, uh, Ben Loman, Brookdale, and Boulder Creek. Uh, the regulations that historically ap apply to state highways may not be a great fit for this rural community served by this uh, Highway 9. And that's one of the, the main reasons this plan is uh, so important. Uh, it's a recognition of the iconic San Lorenzo Valley and the unique conditions of the main street for those communities, Highway 9. Uh, San Lorenzo Valley uh, residents are interested in, in, in slower vehicles, safer walkability, better cycling opportunities, well-conceived disaster, preparedness and relieving congestion at choke points at the SLV, SLV school entrances, Graham Hill Road and Bear Creek in, Road in particular. Uh, it's critically important that projects to improve Highway 9 increase, increase the safety of, for all users, becoming more reliable for first responders and bolster safe uh, exiting in case of an emergency, which have really come to light as we know in the recent fire uh, disasters that we've experienced in California. The valley has the highest rainfall and wildfire risk of any population center within Santa Cruz County year after year. And so there's no doubt the future holds more frequent and intense flooding, slides, road damage, and loss due to fire. After the April 18th meeting we had, uh, I requested Caltrans and the RTC to give an update during today's meeting regarding the status of their discussions on safety projects and improvement along Highway 9. I want to thank again Caltrans for its response in their letter dated June 19th to uh, the RTC Executive Director Guy Preston. After initially screening all 175 project suggestions identified in the draft Highway 9 plan, Caltrans indicated their next steps in collaboration with the RTC to take ownership in delivering feasible solutions sooner rather than later. They have given us a sense of their process to analyze other projects that need further review. The Caltrans response demonstrates a concrete action that I'm very appreciative of for the communication to the community of San Lorenzo Valley. The Highway 9 plan makes clear there will be numerous public agencies involved in implementation of many of these projects, including us, the RTC, County Public Works, and the uh, San Lorenzo Valley School District, among others. But the central agency is Caltrans. Nothing will happen along Highway 9 without Caltrans as the primary party. We have 
we all have a seat at the Caltrans table, but it is their process and regulatory framework that will dictate the progress that is made on any of these projects. I have heard from many San Lorenzo Valley residents who believe that Caltrans process is lacking in both innovation and sense of urgency to get projects built. I empathize with the frustration, but I also understand that if we want to get projects built, we must work with Caltrans in this process. As for myself, I will continue to press for progress and work collaboratively with uh, Caltrans and other agencies involved for projects to get built. Projects need to be, uh, pr uh, progress needs to be visible and timely if we're to fulfill the responsibilities of public officials and make Highway 9 safer for the community it serves. Regarding the speed limits, uh, speed limits came up time and again during the public input process that are highlighted as an issue in this plan. The traditional guidelines set the speed limits for state highways that as act as main streets for rural communities need reconsideration. I know that the California legislature passed Assembly Bill 2363 to establish a zero traffic fatalities task force to, re to reconsider the methodology for setting speed limits. The task force recommendations are coming in uh, 2020. I will be advocating that the task force find ways to lower speed limits on highways that act as main streets for small town centers. We, the speed limits in the town centers are not posted the same as the plan indicates. Fulton, Felton and Boulder Creek are posted at 25. Uh, ben Loman and Brookdale are posted at 30. I hope we can get some consistency in that. And I thank you for your uh, this opportunity to establish the framework and how far we've come. It takes time, and I know people can get uh, frustrated with the timeline, but I wanted to assure you that Caltrans has been cooperative in this venture, and I look to the fulfillment of really uh, implementing a really reasonable uh, Highway 9 corridor plan. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that background, Commissioner McPherson. That's important that we all understand that. And with that, Brianna, why don't you take us through what's in front of us, okay? Okay. Good morning. Brianna Goodman, RTC planner and San Lorenzo Valley resident. Uh, the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan team has worked with the community, Supervisor McPherson's office, Caltrans, the County of Santa Cruz and Metro to develop the Complete Streets Plan for Highway 9 and SLV. Plan area includes the corridor from Henry Cal State Park in Felton to north of Boulder Creek. It is focused on Highway 9, but also on Highway 236 and connecting county roads. The plan identifies, evaluates, and prioritizes Complete Streets concepts that improve safety, access to schools, businesses, and bus stops, and traffic operations for users of all modes of transportation. The plan reflects the community's vision and priorities for the corridor. They include corridor-wide recommendations and designs, 28 location-specific recommendations, including maintenance, walking, biking, traffic flow, transit, and safety projects, as well as the short, middle, and longer-term implementation options. This is a community-based plan, and the plan process includes extensive outreach to the SLV community. It incorporates input we've received since 1913 and <laughs> 2013. Most recently, after publication of the draft plan in January, the project team solicited public input through emails to stakeholders and interested part community members, two well-attended open houses, an online survey, news releases and articles, neighborhood social media groups, community calendars, flyers, RTC committee meetings, at a public hearing at the February RTC meeting. This feedback resulted in modifications to the scope of some of the identified projects and concepts in chapters two and three. And inc this included addition of new components, as well as changes to the proposed implementation chiming in chapter four for several of the projects. A summary of comments received is included in your attachment number three of your agenda. Comments received after the public comment deadline have been included as a handout. A summary of significant edit edits to the document is included in Agenda Attachment 2. It should be mentioned that this is, a, this is a corridor plan planning document to be used as a stepping stone to prioritize projects for more detailed feasibility analysis before being approved for implementation. This document is not itself a final implementation plan. Bringing complete streets improvements to the SLV Highway 9 corridor faces a variety of constraints. Some are physical, such as right-of-way widths between proper, private property and town centers, and right-of-way widths between slopes, trees, retaining walls, and other terrain features between the towns. Some constraints are financial, such as the availability of state, federal, and local funding for construction and maintenance of these projects. 
These constraints create a need to prioritize improvement projects, which is the primary goal of this plan. Please see page four of the executive summary uh, in your agenda packet, that's attachment one, page 17-7, and chapter four of the document for the results of this project prioritization exercise. Implementation is already underway. Last summer, RTC staff secured an HSIP grant to fund safety enhancements to five SLB crosswalks identified in the plan. Caltrans has already been investigating which project concepts could be integrated into near-term shop projects, as well as which suggestions and concepts they recommend County Public Works implement via encroachment permits. We also received strong collaboration on the plan from County Public Works, who are planning to install signage alerting pedestrians and cyclists to alternative routes on county-maintained roads between the SLB schools, campus, and Felton this summer, when they will also improve the existing crosswalk at Felton Empire Road and Cooper Street. RTC, Caltrans, and County Public Works staff will continue to pursue funding opportunities for priority projects in the plan. On June 6, the Commission programmed Measure D funds as part of the five-year plan. In this, one million for San Lorenzo Valley safe routes to schools, funding pre-construction and grant match to add pathways to the SLV schools campus, 250,000 for preliminary scope and engineering documents for near-term projects. RTC, Caltrans, and County Public Works will use funds to conduct more detailed analysis, including cost estimates, engineering, feasibility analysis, and to help prepare applications and secure funds for some of the projects we identified as short-term priorities. RTC staff will return to the Commission for approval to use additional Measure D funds to leverage funding as needed, but given the large list of priorities, we estimate 100 to $200 million worth of projects total, implementing agencies will be looking to maximize all funding options. The project team would like to thank Supervisor McPherson's office, Caltrans, the County of Santa Cruz, Metro, and especially the San Lorenzo Valley community for all their excellent assistance in the creation of this Complete Streets Corridor plan. If the board has any final edits, we will incorporate them into the document before it goes to print. Let staff know if you would like a hard copy of the final found document. Staff suggests that the project list remain a living document so that feedback from the public, Caltrans, and other stakeholders can be added to the identified project list that's Appendix B over time. Staff recommends that the Commission accept the plan, request that Caltrans and the County of Santa Cruz accept the plan, and also work in partnership with the RTC to implement priority projects and concepts, and authorize staff to negotiate funding and co-op agreements with Caltrans and the County, as may be necessary to facilitate implementation. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Brianna. Any questions for Ms. Goodman? I just want to thank Brianna, especially too. I mentioned Rachel, but she's been phenomenal too. Teamwork. Teamwork. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and open up to the public. Any questions of the public? Comments? Come on up. Anything you want to say? Yeah, welcome. Three minutes. I guess life all comes down to timing. Good morning. <laughs> Just want to say that we support all the improvements that are going to take place on Highway 9. I voted yes on Measure D. Back in March when I reviewed the plan, I'd realized that a bus stop was going to be relocated, which is about... Uh, 400 feet from my property, directly onto my property. Not just on my property, but into my property, which would destroy all my fencing, my gardening, my irrigation, all of my security systems and everything that I put in place. That's just for me as a personal homeowner. So I reached out to Rachel. She provided me some guidance on what to do. She suggested that I come up with two different alternate sites for a bus stop, which I did provide. And so I created a 30-page document to have everything to show that putting a bus stop on the corner of Lazy Woods and Highway 9 would be very, very destructive, not only to myself, but dangerous into the safety of not only the commuters on Highway 9, but especially to all the residents of Lazy Woods itself. So I went ahead and reached out to all my neighbors and gathered a petition of 33 signatures, all opposing the bus stop being placed on the corner of Highway 9 and Lazy Woods. We have uh, fire hydrants there so first responders would be limited if you have a bus that's parked right there. All of the residents that live on the Lazy Woods cul-de-sac, they all turn left onto Highway 9 going south towards Santa Cruz. Having a bus sitting right there on the property would be able to limiting the view of people being able to look out to the right to see the oncoming traffic. So I propose an alternate bus stop since uh, Rachel said that the main thing is to be able to have folks from, especially students, from the east side of the highway or the northbound side of the highway to be able to have access to the other side of the highway going to the high school. 
So I proposed another bus stop that was 150 feet down that's closer to that particular crosswalk and also a stoplight to be put on El Soyo Heights with a um, walkway to go up El Soyo Heights that'll allow the students to be able to walk rather than having to trespass through the church property. So I wanted to make this known that if there is a bus stop, we really would not, all of us, not just myself, but all the residents that I represent in Lazy Woods would not want to have that place there, but place somewhere else. So Rachel was able to reach out to uh, Kimley and Horn and ask them to redraft. And I just reviewed the redrafting. Now, the original redrafting was item 3.34. That was the diagram, which is for project number 11. Project number 11, which is diagram 3.38, does state add a shelter to the transit, relocate bus stop closer to crosswalk <clears throat> near Osoyo Heights, as to where the original one said relocate existing bus stop to the northeast corner of Lazy Woods Road and add a bus stop shelter. In the diagram, it still points to the corner of Lazy Woods on 3.38. So that's still concerning to me. I want to make sure there is no future misconceptions about what that could be. So I understand my time is up, but and I'm not sure of the protocols of this council, but I'd like to be able to submit this document so that it is on record. Myself, but all the residents of Lazy Woods, all 36 of us really would oppose having a bus stop there. But we do support all the uh, improvements on Highway 9. So thank you for your time. Thanks for your comments. Can we, can we get an electronic version of that from the staff? Not today, I mean, at some point? Yes. Thank you. you have a clarification point yeah, for me there? Yeah, just to, for to add to that, in the staff report, there's a link to our website, and every single comment, including that 30-page document that we received from the public during the, not only during the official public comment period, but after the official comment period, are all posted on the project website. Thank you for that. Or if somebody anything else. Next speaker. We'll, we'll hook it up. Hi, my name's Joni Martin, and I'm a resident of San Lorenzo Valley for almost 30 years now. I raised a couple kids there. I live in Felton um, near the schools, and my children have been frequent pedestrians um, between the schools and downtown Felton. Our entire family has biked and walked Highway 9, and I appreciate that action is finally being taken on this. I think it's tragic that it took a death to seemingly really grease the wheels to increase the um, the speed with which this is happening. Um, I'm going to try to just give you a couple of my very specific local comments. And then I also, if I can, I'd like to speak on behalf of a mom who came with her toddler and had to leave. So we'll see if I have enough time for that. My very specific comments are that I appreciate that um, a short-term solution that we need in order to get people off of the narrowest, most dangerous part of Highway 9 right now is to increase awareness of two bypass alternate routes that people can take. Um, one is off of Fall Creek Drive and one is off of Clearview Avenue. And I understand County Public Works has agreed to put signs at their um, point that they can do that on those roads. Unfortunately, those signs are going to be far enough off of Highway 9 that it almost is just a symbolic act. Because if someone doesn't already know to take that route, if they're coming down Highway 9, they're not going to see them, I don't think, where we were shown that the signs would be placed. So that would be the first thing, a little local knowledge I'd like to share with you, is that it would be a much better improvement to have a sign approved by Caltrans to be actually at Highway 9 saying, take the Clearview route, take the um, Fall Creek route as an alternate. The other thing I'd like to say about those two alternate routes is, of course, that they are really short-term interim solutions, that the real solution we need is the widening of the shoulder there because people are always going to take the most direct path. They're going to have that inclination. Cyclists who aren't local to the community, fa even families that don't just live in our neighborhoods that Clearview and Fall Creek go up to, typically aren't aware of those bypass routes. So the widening of the shoulder is really the key um, improvement that we need. So thank you for considering the signage to the bypass routes. Um, but And let's get that done quickly, as quickly as possible. I feel like that should have been done months ago after Josh's tragic accident. Um, now, if I can, I'd like to share the comments of Leah Samuels, who came here with a toddler and waited for about an hour and a half till she had to leave to get her three-year-old from preschool. She recently moved to Felton and had heard about the dangers of Highway 9 and hoped that they were overrated. 
um, she decided to attend um, by foot a local festivity and went with her three-year-old daughter and she said it was terrifying and that they were nearly hit twice on the way to the local festival. And so she would like to urge the prioritization of this um, because environmentally we need people out of our cars, we need people walking and biking for the health and independence of our children. We want that to happen um, and it needs to be able to be done safely. So thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Welcome. Um, my name is Kelly Howard. I'm Josh's mom, so forgive me, but I'm going to be um, <clears throat> difficult. Um, I know this has been going on for about 11 years, and I didn't know that until my son was killed. And I know there has to be numbers to get action. He's a person, and he's mine. And I know nothing can change what happened. And we can't bring him back. But I want to prevent another family feeling this pain every day that uh, me and his family feel. It's horrific. Um, it will never go away. Um, and I still see Highway 9 in the area that he was killed, the same as it was, and rumble strips, um, curbing, something that's minimal could have prevented the vehicle from just going over the line. Um, uh, uh, in environmentally, you know, California Environmental Quality Act, it's on the line. I don't know if that is de minimis or what, but um, it just seems that something could be done. And um, I appreciate the signage that is going to deter the children to go up and in a safer route. Um, but like Johnny said, they're going to do the quickest way. Um, and I really think Caltrans needs to do what they can to help and save lives. I don't want any more numbers. I don't want numbers to help move this forward. Josh is not a number. <laughs> He's my son. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I just, I need to see change. Please. Thank you. Thank, thank you. This commission truly regrets your loss. And we appreciate you taking the time to make this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, I am Brian Largay. <clears throat> I'm a resident of Felton. Um, Highway 9 is broken, uh, like our hearts are broken. Hundreds of residents uh, along this section of road drive to the highway, drive to the grocery store, to the pool, even though they could walk there easily. Many of us have no choice uh, because we can't drive or our parents need to work or because we're dedicated to climate solutions. Hundreds of kids could easily walk to school. Parents won't let them. They give them body armor in the shape of a car. All those extra trips make for traffic nightmares and the frustrated drivers make it even less safe. If a Caltrans crew had to walk the route to school, the engineer would determine that a dangerous condition exists or perhaps an imminent hazard. The risks to the Caltrans crew would be unacceptable. They would close the lane. A kid walking to school is subjected to those conditions for perhaps eight to 40 hours a year. Our Complete Streets law calls for safe mobility for all users, including bicyclists and pedestrians. Since 2008, when Complete Streets was passed, U.S. pedestrian fatalities have increased 41%. Conditions have changed. Smartphones or legal marijuana or long, longer commutes. <coughs> for those who walk or ride, that body armor looks a lot like a weapon. Unless the RTC leads, nothing will change. 
after Josh died, Supervisor McPherson and Assembly Member Stone, as we heard, met with Caltrans. They asked for simple actions now, signage, striping, to direct kids to safer routes, easily accessible. In your packet, Caltrans shares a timeline for safety improvements of 2026. I hope I read that wrong. Highway 9 has 30% of the vehicle trips of Highway 17, 20% of Mid-County Highway 1. Those roads receive vastly greater investment in safety. 10% of the county lives in the San Lorenzo Valley. Far less than 10% of RTC funds are invested in the valley. Measure D was a nail biter and our votes put it over the top. We need the RTC to drive the process forward. Please embrace this work. That's the only way to get this mess fixed before we lose more members of our community. Thank you for those comments. Welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm Josh, his stepfather. Um, I just wanted to thank Bruce. Sounds like you've been doing a lot of hard work on the issue. Um, Highway 9 is so dangerous. I think one of the hardest parts since the accident is continuing to drive up and down Highway 9 and seeing the kids be able to get to school. There will be another tragedy if something doesn't get done, so I, I just want to make this brief. Um, I just urge you to do whatever you can to work with Caltrans. Caltrans work with RTC, so some improvements, um, we can see some improvements been made. I mean, everything's on paper right now. Until some action gets taken on the roads, we haven't done anything. And we don't want to wait for another tragedy uh, to happen to push it even more. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jean Ratcliffe. I live in Felton. And um, I'm here for two things. Uh, specifically, I live in Felton and we walk on Highway 9. Um, I don't have children. I do have an elderly mother who walked from our home down to the um, restaurant on Highway 9 without supervision, unbeknownst to me. And I was terrified because she was walking on a narrow pathway, very poorly lit, and fortunately nothing happened to her. But I feel the same way that a parent would feel about a child walking that same route. Um, really terrifying. Uh, we do try to walk. We know the back ways because we're locals. We know how to get down to the ice cream without going on Highway 9. Um, but it is longer, and I totally endorse what um, my neighbors have said. Um, my second comment is um, I served as a planning commissioner for many years in Southern California, and I was in involved in several very large long-term um, planning projects with Caltrans. And um, it was a different district, and every district has its own culture. But I will say that um, Caltrans, despite local impact, insisted on prioritizing car traffic over everything. Um, I lived in San Juan Capistrano, which has a very large pedestrian community. And um, despite testimony and repeated input from the community, they never took into account the local importance of pedestrian traffic, with the result that we had some very badly designed um, freeway improvements that actually increased the likelihood of pedestrian accidents. That's not going to happen here because, I, frankly, I don't think 9 could get any more dangerous for pedestrians than it is currently. I really don't think it could. But um, I will say that I'm glad that Caltrans is engaged with everybody, but we need to make sure that local priorities are communicated and that it's not just how many cars can we move per hour because I think that's the default for Caltrans. That's their job is to move cars. But it is our main street, and um, there are our families and our kids, and frankly, tourists. You know, uh, it looks like a cute little town. You're walking from boutique to restaurant, and you have no idea that you're walking along a straight highway with, you know, 18 inches of clearance on your way to the cafe <laughs> or, or, or whatever you're going to. I think it's clearly... Um, <laughs> <laughs> a high priority, and anything that can be done to speed the process up, as previous speakers have mentioned, is important, but also keeping the focus on the most vulnerable sector of 
the public, and that would be pedestrians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Donna Zeal. I'm a 48-year resident of the San Lorenzo Valley. And for many years, I served as Mark Stone's alternate on the RTC when he was supervisor. So I have some sense about the planning process and the various funding streams that come into the process. Um, I, um, I want to support the fast tracking of the improvements as everyone else has spoken f about. Um, and I, th I think what motivated me to be here today more than anything else is that I was in my car as they were performing CPR on Josh. And I, th I watched that and I don't want to ever watch that again. Please, please act quickly on this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. My name is Audrey Johnson, and I've owned a home in highway, on Highway 9 in Felton for 25 years. Um, sorry, I didn't, I planned on going to work today. Um, I raised four amazing kids who attended SLV schools from preschool through graduation. They would often walk home or bike home from school, but with the current dangers, I would never consider that a safe option. Um, four years ago, my son, David, um, was hit by a truck in front of Henry Cowell on Highway 9, <clears throat> which threw him over the guardrail. Um, and as I sat with him, um, and we came to the realization that his leg was not going to make it. Um, I'm thankful every day that he made it. Um, but it, it's been an ordeal. And Highway 9 is so dangerous. And something has to be done. Um, my home and adjacent property um, are clearly identified and pictured pictured in various RTC documents as a primary challenge, um, yet no one has ever reached out to me regarding this. Um, you can see my property on the Priority Projects 3-21, 28, uh, 27, 28, and 29, and Appendix F, page 7. Um, The roadsides that are usable by pedestrians are often zero. Um, in some of these things, it says less than three feet of a shoulder, but it's more like three inches, maybe. Um, there's um, landscaping issues that aren't maintained by Caltrans. There's um, water pools, um, and Caltrans knows or has known for years and years that that's an issue, and yet it hasn't been resolved. And it makes it so that people actually have to walk into Highway 9, into the road to get around it. When on trash days, when we're required to put our bins out on the street, there is no path. You have to walk into the street or, you know, kids will run and dash through my private driveway. And I'm happy to see that happen. I, I never yell at them to stop. I always allow them to walk through my property. Um, the intersection there, um, there's three, three southbound and one northbound lanes. Um, and what happens is that um, people are constantly, there's no way to cross, there's like three crosswalks. So there's no way to cross the one side of the road. And that means people are constantly playing a life and death game of Frogger, um, running through moving traffic on the stretch of road in front of my house. Um, resulting in um, countless close calls. Um, sorry. The accident um, that resulted in Josh's death occurred in front of my house. I actually was on my patio and heard it happen. Um, I didn't know at the time, but I learned later what happened. Um, it happens all the time, and so I'm sort of immune to it. But um, 
I just want to impress on you today how critical it is and how precarious the current situation is along the Highway 9 <coughs> corridor and urge you to prioritize the aspects of this project that will make it safe for pedestrians, most of whom are kids, to get from the SLV campuses to downtown Felton. Well, thank, thank you for sharing with us. My name is Gabrielle Brick. I live and work in Felton. Um, I live off of San Lorenzo near the Bigfoot Museum and I'm certainly in favor of um, all of the um, crosswalk improvements between there. I work at San Lorenzo Valley Elementary School where I teach second grade. And that's the main, one of the biggest reasons I'm here because I'd like, I'm asking you to expedite the changes to the intersection to change the flow of traffic into and out of the tri-campus area, specifically where there is no light in front of my elementary school. Um, I am the teacher who more than anybody else has parking lot duty after school. And I'm the person who stands in the parking lot with the stop sign, like a Caltrans worker, directing traffic. Um, we have two lanes that enter our school parking lot one of which um, is for people picking up curbside where we have one and a half parking spaces for curbside pickup. Um, the other lane is with but has school buses and we have about 250, 300 kids between grades one through three being dismissed at 215 as well as a few hundred more middle school students being dismissed at 220. Um, and I am directing traffic from people leaving curbside pickup to people entering the parking lot searching for a parking space. That is, there's only one um, lane for people to exit or find parking. Sometimes people are backing up in addition to all of that. And there's pedestrians trying to get to their cars. So it is all I can do to keep chaos at bay. And my understanding is that um, the reason our parking lot hasn't been redesigned is that there's a multi-jurisdictional process that has to happen involving Caltrans. So I'm asking you to expedite that. I think if you look at the volume of people that not only does our school parking lot serve on a daily basis, but the number of people that are uh, impacted in terms of traffic backing up far up Highway 9 because nobody's going anywhere in our parking lot to be able to turn right or southbound to enter or turning left into our parking lot. Um, I've worked at many schools, summer school teacher in Cupertino, as well as um, in Live Oak School District, and I, I can't think of a more poorly designed parking lot. Um, I don't know if there's ever a traffic study done when the two, two of our four elementary schools were closed more than 12 years ago, but for the number of kids that we're serving, it's, it's egregious. And so I'm asking you to change that um, as soon as possible and appreciate the work that uh, Supervisor McPherson has done with our school district to um, identify these issues, um, as well as just say that I happen to be about five cars behind um, when Josh was killed. And then I'm so glad that I didn't see anything because it's profoundly disturbing. But I'm not at all surprised that it happened and I'm, I fear when a child or an adult is injured or killed in our school parking lot. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name's Christopher Holmes. I live in Felton, I've been there since 2005. I'm here to support this project. I have a 12 year old and a 10 year old that both go to SLV. I'm one of those people that put a steel cage around my kids to go to school and come back. Um, I'm reluctant to let them walk even from school to Fall Creek just because it's a little bit wonky in terms of the protection that they have. But I encourage all of you to really go over there, take a walk yourself. There's nothing like being there in person and seeing the situation and getting a handle on it mentally so that you could you know, put yourself in our shoes and decide whether you'd let your children walk there and what might be done to solve the problem. So I'd encourage you to please expedite the project and take everybody comments into consideration. And I represent all the people that couldn't be here today with kids my age that go to SLB. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Jim Helmer. I'm 68 year resident of Ben Lomond. Um, and those of you that know me, you know I am passionate about traffic safety. I spent 11 years in these council chambers working for the city of Santa Cruz, implementing plans like livable streets, residential, preferred parking permits, and I personally wrote the city's first master bicycle master plan, which has laid the foundation for the largest bike plan in the county. Following Santa Cruz, I worked 21 years for the city of San Jose, still living in Ben Lomond, and I developed the traffic calming plan and policy. I implemented the Street Smarts public education and awareness program in San Jose. It warms my heart to see that City of Santa Cruz has adopted that plan which the State Office of Traffic Safety Grant allowed cities to adopt this plan, and now it's in full force in Santa Cruz. More recently, I wrote the complete streets plan for the smallest city in the Bay Area, Monte Sereno. So call it livable streets, traffic calming, or complete streets, it's all the same. You've heard it. In the 90s, the federal law changed, allowing transportation commissions to make decisions on about 70% of the federal gas tax for local and regional planning and projects. However, state transportation agencies primarily retained responsibilities for all maintenance and all operations. So we have split responsibilities as we've heard today. Activities like ditch cleaning, paving, striping, stop sign analysis, traffic signal timing, those are maintenance and operations. Those should be low hanging fruit items. They should move quickly. So this plan is a blueprint for the future. Let's try to look forward. I came here today to talk a lot about how we could marry the shop program, the bridge restoration, the bridge replacement, culvert replacement programs to this plan. I don't have to say that. It's in the letter. The dates are way too far out, but we can work to, to move those up. So let's marry the shop, maintenance, bridge, and culvert plans to this plan. On my way here today, I counted 11 retaining walls between Ben Lomond and Felton, some as low as two feet high at the bus stops at Park Avenue and El Soyo Heights, some as high as 20 feet at the traffic signal at Glen Arbor Road. I also saw two areas where water is still oozing out of the mountains. May I have just a little more? Still oozing out of the mountains, one right near El Soyo Heights curb and the other one, tragically, where we've heard people testifying today about the death. It's unacceptable to be having moss and algae out in our driving lanes in July. Marrying the shop program is a win-win-win. We'll have better pavement, safer walking and cycling, wider shoulders, and fewer fixed object collisions. If you looked at chart 2.7 in this report, the fixed object collisions added to the pedestrian injuries outweigh by far the vehicle to vehicle collisions. That's, that's not good. We have cars running off the road, hitting fixed objects like redwood trees, utility poles, fences, and guardrails, and sometimes people. So in closing, I would just like to say that I would like to see some of those innovative bonding and general fund reserve type programs complement the local streets that are included in this plan. In Ben Lomond, we, for seven years, we've been talking about a walk, walking path on Glen Arbor Road for two blocks. That's in this plan. So let's marry it, marry it to, the, to the other priorities. And then finally, I personally spent probably more time than the consultants on the highway camp on the campus plan. My drawing is in the study. It's looked at and called the long range alternative. However, I will tell you that the 
proposals in the plan that call for two right turn pockets. That's not a 20 year solution. That's not a 30 year solution. It's not even a solution to the problems described by the young lady. We need to re-engineer the whole campus entrance and the walkway systems from there to Felton. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. My name is Tom Fredericks, and um, the, the only thing I wanted to add is, uh, as I listen to, first of all, it's not surprising to me there's so many people from Felton because um, that's where I think the most urgent need is for something to be done. And as I was listening to others describe the, you know, with deep emotion, their own experience of this segment, I realized that the commissioners, very few of you probably have a picture of this. And the only thing I, I, I wanted to add then in order to help fill out that picture is that when people refer to the school or to the SLV campus, it is a campus. It's literally where every student in the valley goes to school. It's preschool, it's elementary school, it's middle school, and it's high school, all in one spot, one mile, less than a mile from downtown Felton. And anybody, like my daughter, we live in the, where my daughter could have walked to school every day. She's 20 years old now, but um, I would never let her do that. I tried to bike a couple summers ago to use the pool. I thought, you know, I'm a mile away, I'll take a bike. I did it once. You know, it's just not worth it. So I wanted to just make sure you understood um, for the people who don't have a picture of this, that this campus is the school campus in the entire San Lorenzo Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public like to address this topic? Let's go ahead and close the public comment, bring it back for discussion and recommendation. <coughs> I just want to thank everybody who uh, showed up and, went, and to mention that um, uh, aside from that stretch that where the, the tragedy happened to Josh Howard, that uh, a key component of all of this is the school campus that, that really houses everybody from uh, kindergarten through high school. So there's thousands, you know, a couple thousand kids there, I think, or uh, teachers and staff. Um, it is it is part an integral part of how we correct this because in the morning it's like a parking lot and in, in the afternoon it's like a park parking lot on Highway 9 and it can lead to a lot of frustration and uh, so that will be addressed. It's it is uh, going to be a long term project with a cooperative effort again from Caltrans, RTC, the county, and the school district. But uh, we it's on the radar and. Uh, I hope it can be done as quickly as possible. Realistically, it's probably three or four or five years away, but um, I just, uh, I think it's, um, uh, it's uh, you know, something that we, it is included in the plan. I want everybody to be clear on that. And I, I can't tell, uh, again, everybody how, how much I appreciate uh, us getting this together and having this as a special item on the agenda. And when the time comes, I'd like to move the recommended actions, but I think there might be some more comments. We can go ahead and make that motion now. Make that motion to approve the recommended actions. Uh, I'll second proposals. the motion. A second by Kaufman Gomez. And do you have a comment? Um, I do. Um, I'd like to make sure that the public has that timeline that, it, that they see where it's going and how we've achieved getting to that goal. And again, this one, I don't know if it's like a full 30 year of the life of the bond, if this were to be part of a project that's feasible for that in the overall RTC bond feasibility so that we, we can do some things that are priority on things like this, especially life-saving um, projects that need to take place. And uh, the other recommendation too is when these come up, it would be good for us to have a visual of this plan that because we're not all familiar with the location, but as they describe some of these streets, then we can actually visualize that in the presentation. Thank you. Commissioner Rodkin. First, I, I want to appreciate the members of the public that testified to us on this issue. Um, I think their passion is well justified by the reality of what's going on. Um, it probably evidence that I'm too long in local government that I understand why it might take three or four years to do a permanent fix 
even five years to do a permanent fix of this problem in that one mile between Graham Hill Road and, and uh, Highway 9 and the schools. I understand that. Uh, most, most members of the public don't. You know, the environmental work you have to go through, the studies, the engineering work, all of that. But I don't have any patience for the idea that we can't do the short-term things. And, you know, I'm not a traffic engineer, but bots dots along the, the stripe of the road at least so that there's some rumble strip or something if people run into it. Um, the signage that tells kids not that they're all going to take advantage of it, as people I think correctly pointed out, but the, that would give people an alternative to walking along. And I've, I've been up there. I assume other members have. People said we hadn't seen it. A lot of us have actually been up there and seen it. Um, why those aren't being done by now is not understandable to me. I really don't get it. I, I understand, you know, statewide bureaucracies or district-wide bureaucracies in, Cal, in uh, Caltrans are difficult to work with, funding issues and so forth. But I know that the county and RTC would step up with the money to make these short term. I mean, it's a trivial amount of money for the things we're talking about, signage and lots of dots on the road. And, you know, there may be a number of other small term things. And as, as I said, I'm willing to be patient, even though the public may not appreciate it, why it's the permanent fix, because there's right of way issues. Uh, you need more space to make it a permanent fix here, expensive engineering stuff to move that retaining wall by property, et cetera. I get that, but I don't get it why we're not doing the short-term stuff next week. I just don't get it. Mr. Brown. Yeah, I uh, um, just want to really echo that and put an exclamation, double exclamation mark at the end of it. I mean, well put. I don't understand it either. I, um, I do think that... Um, obviously, the, the longer term, the shoulders and, and all of that work is going to take time. But um, these things, <coughs> and, and again, maybe I, th now that you've said it, um, Commissioner Rock, and I'll, I'll echo it because I don't understand exactly how much time all of these things take and what the holdups are. But it would be really helpful to know, and I'd like to try to see what we can do at this level to kind of move that, those things forward. I appreciate that. Our staff has reached out and talked about the and tried to address the signage issue um, and other items. But could we get a report back or something to give us a sense of when you know why when this is going to we can expect this to move even the short term things, especially because the longer term is going to take up to five years. Any other comments? Right here. Go ahead, Director Leo. Well. Um, I just want to thank everybody for sh uh, sharing their testimony. It was powerful testimony uh, about an a, a incredibly tragic uh, circumstance. And I think that all the speakers highlighted that um, the, the likelihood of more tragedy unless something's done. And, I, and it, it, it really hit me emotionally, and, and, I, and I appreciate people taking the time to share that with us. It's important for us. I, I think it would be incumbent upon our Caltrans representative uh, uh, at our regular meetings to give us some update about these short-term um, uh, efforts uh, because I'm not sure it's an RTC uh, 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 funding or staff issue, but it's a Caltrans, uh, it's, a, it's their road. And so to the extent that, that our Caltrans representative could be prepared to, to talk about how we could get uh, some of these short terms, the, the questions of signage and whether it be rumble strips or bot dots or whatever that is, um, it would just be really helpful that when we come back here in August that we have some report about getting those uh, 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 things done and giving some impression to us that there's, that there's a fire to, to, to get the larger uh, pieces done. I appreciate the work of my colleague, Supervisor McPherson, who's been really committed to uh, focusing on the, these issues and fighting to secure funding um, uh, uh, f to deal with uh, pedestrian issues. And I'm glad that we included money in Measure D to do just that. Um, and the public has said that they want that. We want that, and you know, Caltrans plays a big, a big role here. And I think you, it, you, it would be really helpful. I'm, I, I, 
the, the re representative here today, I don't want to put on, uh, completely on the spot because he's not our regular representative here. We usually see a Aileen Lowe. And, um, but I think it would be really helpful at our meeting in August to get an update about that. Can I just say one clear, just a clarifying point. I, I recognize when I made my comments, I didn't mean to suggest that this is the RTC's responsibility primarily or solely, um, but just wanted to say like, if there's anything we can do to help facilitate that, and yes, it would be really important to get a report about progress from Caltrans. Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, yeah, I'm really appreciative of everybody that came today and, um, and spoke. Uh, I, I just have a qu it's a question and a comment and uh, maybe a suggestion at the same time, uh, looking at these conditions, uh, and the taking the time that it's going to be taking to, to make these improvements. And, and I'm wondering, is there, is there any way that the school district or our agency also and the county can join forces and somehow get some sort of small transportations for these kids that are walking at that time to safely transport them from a, a, a safe point in Felton to the school without them having to walk that dangerous section of, of the road for that, for that time frame. I mean, I don't know if that's doable or if it can be done, but I mean, the, personally, I think the safety of the children throughout the county is important. Um, and so I think that's what we have to look at first is how can we get our kids safely to the destination that they need to get to if they need to walk uh, and they have no other mode of transportation and how can we supply that? Before I call for the vote, I just want to acknowledge two things which I think the board shares in common and that is, in my opinion of how government's supposed to work, this is the way that the public is supposed to come and present to government. I, I commend you on your presentation your factualness, your respect, and the passion that was involved here. And, and I think because of that, you've motivated this body to try to do whatever possible. And I, and I wish we could see more of that in public government interactions. And with that, I think uh, just professionally, I think what I'd like to do is just direct staff to uh, take this challenge on to interact with Caltrans, uh, see if there is such a thing as some low hanging fruit here that we can acquire uh, and come back to us, uh, put this on a future agenda about some things that we might be able to do. And if we need to do something to budget money to accommodate some of this, that's something surely we can discuss at a later date. So can, can we do that? And did you have a comment? I don't want to cut you out of this and, and we don't want to put you on the spot either. Right. Thank you. Um, and my silence is not for wanting to comment, but I definitely wanted to yield to everyone. So, so appreciate that. And as all have expressed, you know, we've worked well together in the study and we're right at, you know, the point of implementation. So by your action today and uh, approving this report and all the good work that RTC staff and the tremendous amount of support from the community from the very beginning, from the, from the bus ride for that effort, um, that, that's, this, is this, this is the step we need to be at. And so we, we thank you for that. And uh, our recent correspondence kind of outlines some of the longer term you know, implementation strategies, but the key is implementation. A and there definitely are some very short term implementation things as well that we're in, in um, communication with county staff right now about doing. So thank, thank you for you know, the priorities put on this and uh, we we're glad to be able to fund the study and we're definitely right here as the partner um, for the different steps and the different um, levels of implementation. We're gonna invite RTC staff to participate in uh, all of our project development teams regarding things Highway 9. Um, actually this effort, well, and actually I'll back up a, a huge thanks uh, as well for the, you know, the, if without the Measure D, you know, a lot of these conversations we wouldn't even be, be able to get to have as well. So that's a tremendous benefit to be able to move forward to these next steps. So we appreciate all, we appreciate, you know, all, all the steps that are now falling into place while we're taking, while we're trying to take measured, you know, analysis of each, um, of each proposal and we've gone through them all and we've, we've been able to see, you know, which ones, in fact, that's kind of part of the implementation strategy or, finding out which one of these projects are ones that can be put, put, in, put in immediately, put in midterm, put in long-term, and, and where they fit, where they fit within our programs to be able to implement. Uh, the, the, the bigger projects, as Mr. Helmer has provided, uh, that restructuring of the, high, of, the, of the campus locations, that's another one of those that is gonna fit into our overall um, cost, uh, cost scope and schedule, larger big picture project implementation plan. So um, we're, we're right where we need to be and your action today supports that. And it also solidifies uh, what the community's values are because par part of the concern um, in some of these plans are there might be proposals that have direct impact to certain property owners. We heard a few of that today. 
And so by your action and, and more or less endorsing what this plan says, that gives us the ability now to go forward and, and work with the agencies to implement. Thanks for, that. Thanks for sharing those comments. Appreciate it. Well, with that, uh, it's time for this body yeah, to I take. I just want, uh, you know, to this low-hanging fruit is referenced. Um, uh, I think we're, we're there, really. We know some of the things that could happen. Maybe we should, uh, I could uh, direct the staff to, you know, with Caltrans just to give us a report on what, what those projects are, what might be. Uh, I don't know if August is, is reasonable or September, or, but I'd like to do it quickly. Well, I asked actually for it to be today. Um, that was the, the portion of the Caltrans letter that I immediately picked up the phone and said, we need to be prepared to start to answer these questions. Um, I've received very strong cooperation from Caltrans. Um, I have, have worked with these problems in the past, and the level of attention that Caltrans is giving to Highway 9 is g greater than I've seen before. I've received assurances from the Caltrans District 5 Director Tim Gummins that they're thinking outside of the box, and they actually are planning on implementing some of these things. They just weren't quite ready at this meeting yet, but they will continue to receive phone calls from me, emails from me, meetings with me until we figure out a way to get some of this low hanging fruit off the table, implemented, and then working towards some long range solutions. Thank you. Well, let's begin the process and uh, we have a motion and a second. So uh, all in favor, Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let's get some work done. Thank you very much for your attendance today and, and your patience for staying uh, to the afternoon. Okay, it takes us to uh, item 18. This is an alternatives analysis for high capacity public transit on the right away scope of work request. <coughs> oh no, this is Ginger. <laughs> Hi, Ginger. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Ginger Dicar, I'm a senior transportation planner here at RTC staff. My item on the agenda today is to discuss the scope of work for the alternatives analysis of high capacity public transit on the rail right of way. Unified corridor investment study completed in January 2019 contained a performance based planning approach utilizing a triple bottom line framework of sustainability, economy, environment, and equity. The outcome from the Unified Corridor Investment Study was to, number one, protect the rail right-of-way for a high-capacity public transit service next to a bicycle and pedestrian trail, and continue to consider passenger rail service on the rail right-of-way consistent with Proposition 116 requirements. The second uh, was to work jointly with Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District to develop a scope of work for additional analysis of high-capacity public transit alternatives on the Santa Cruz branch rail line, including their cost, operations, and funding plans, and a plan to protect Metro's current funding sources. RTC staff has been working closely with Metro over the last few months to develop a scope of work for consultant services to perform the alternatives analysis and develop a business plan for high capacity public transit on the rail right of way. RTC staff is here today to get your input. Metro staff will be going to their board of directors for review and input on the scope of work for the alternatives analysis tomorrow, June 28th. The alternatives analysis will evaluate various options for transit that advances sustainability and triple bottom line, economy, equity, and environment. There have been numerous comments from members of the community that have been received after the packet from this meeting was um, became available, expressing concern that the scope of work for the consultant does not include a triple bottom line analysis to evaluate environment and equity in addition to cost. I want to assure all that the alternatives analysis will very much consider <coughs> the benefits of the alternatives in ter terms of economy, environment, and equity. They are part of the RTC planning goals that are referenced in task 3.1. It'll be easy to uh, include additional language in the scope of work for the request for proposal to make this clearer. Uh, the first step in the alternatives analysis will be to solicit input from the public on the criteria and performance measures that will be used to compare the various alternatives. But this discussion is just beginning. This is just the very first step along a, uh, a detailed process. The RTC for at least the last 10 years has been taking an approach to decision making that includes a triple bottom line analysis. It's part of the three E's or the environment, equity, and economy of the policies that are developed in the regional transportation plan. 
Um, and reading the comments, I was actually heartened to hear that community members very much see the value in the triple bottom line analysis, and that they want this type of analysis to continue. And that is very much the intent of this project. The tasks in the scope of work include develop a public and stakeholder outreach plan and implement it, identify the goals and objectives, and determine the screening criteria and performance measures for evaluating the alternatives. Develop the alternatives to evaluate and conduct value engineering to further define the alternatives. Compare alternatives based on performance measure analysis, including transit travel time, cost, vehicle miles traveled, greenhouse gas emissions, service to disadvantaged communities, uh, and equity, social equity. Identify the preferred alternative and document the alternative analysis in a report and develop a business plan that includes a funding strategy of the preferred alternative and assesses Metro funding through 2045. <coughs> the timeline for the alternatives analysis or proposed timeline is uh, next week to provide the, to release the request proposals for alternatives analysis in August will be the deadline for the proposals uh, to be submitted. The uh, project team will be um, evaluating and choosing a consultant to perform the work. And so on September 5th, we plan to uh, provide this recommendation to the commission on a consultant contract. <coughs> At that time, um, there will be an improved scope of work that we will we'll have worked with the consultant that we choose um, to work with based on the, uh, propose the various proposals that are received. And in December 2020, the final alternatives analysis report. So with that, the RTC staff recommendation is that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission review and provide input on the draft scope of work for the alternatives analysis uh, to be released in the request for proposals for consultant services. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Ginger. Any questions for Ms. Dykar? Commissioner Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and uh, I strongly support this triple bottom line analysis. As I look at the, at the questions in here, it, it's, it, it doesn't seem to capture that uh, completely um, around uh, I mean, outside the, uh, one uh, bullet point about key climate vulnerabilities, um, it looks like all the all uh, all the measures would are, you know, m uh, monetary, more economic, uh, and I'm concerned that w that the strategy which we have used looking at this triple bottom line has helped us make so many of these decisions. Um, are you saying that that in this scope we wouldn't? You're suggesting not seeing it, but in the the eventual analysis that we would be taking a look at all those things and how do how is that backed up by what we have in front of us? I I, I feel it's always tricky to have a balance in the scope of work that you put out in the release for proposals because you're trying to get these consultants that have expertise in working on these types of projects from various different communities to lend a hand towards developing the detailed tasks that are, will be performed in this project. So you wanna give enough information so that you give them the sense from the project team what level of um, detail we're looking at, but you don't wanna line every, every single thing up necessarily because it's gonna be a process between the project team, the consultant team, and obviously we have many um, opportunities that we need to take go, go to the public, via this commission, the RTC advisory committees, the stakeholders to develop all of these. And then where I see the, um, the triple bottom line comes in in developing the performance measures. Again, in this task 3.1, it states that we will be following regional, local, uh, state, federal planning guidelines and goals. We have those developed. The triple bottom line is a part of that. Um, I am more than happy to revise the scope introduction or elsewhere to make sure that's included. Uh, uh, and I appreciate that, and I, and, I've, and, and I value the work that you put in. I know you put a lot of work in the RTP, and, and, you, and you obviously looked at this as part of the Unified Corridor uh, strategy, but we're partnering with another agency which, uh, which hasn't talked about that, not to say that they don't believe in it. So because it's not in here, it's, it's hard to know whether that is a shared interest and whether 
those measures would be included. That's that's the part that it's you know as a public document, it, you know it 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 doesn't capture that. And I think it's important for us to to, to be clear um, as this process goes through that we're going to be looking at a broad range of uh, of issues. So I'm sure there'll be other comments, uh, but it may be something to consider before we send it out. Commissioner Brown. Yeah, um, I would concur with that and, and also just say that I think an additional reason for making that clear uh, clear early on is because I think it will um, benefit us in terms of the public engagement that we, we do get moving forward to actually, rather than hearing over and over what's missing, um, to actually be receiving comments that, that get, that are um, addressed more towards um, what we do want to see, and just I guess think making that clear up front, and for all of the reasons that Commissioner Leopold stated, it seems like it is worth spending a little more time on that before the scope of work is released. Good question, Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the actually, I, I concur with um, the opinions that we have here in terms of making sure that we have a robust scope that we need here, so that we don't have to reinvent afterwards because obviously we're all trying to get to a conclusion and if we find out in the conclusion that we didn't include everything that we should have in the study, I wanna make sure that we're really um, there. And the concern that I had with the last study that was performed was uh, the type of outreach and making sure that we're getting to um, the population that we're looking to, to represent here. Um, we, we've had the disadvantaged community and we're not effectively reaching out to them and we need to do better. We need to do better with um, finding out where they're at, where we can get to them, um, flexibility of the types, because the community room in Watsonville, if we get anybody, half of it or two thirds of it are not even from Watsonville anyway. So we really need to make sure that when we're putting these together, that we're engaging in the community that we're intended the outreach to be happening from. You know, it's we, we, there's a cultural aspect that's much different um, South County than it is mid and even North County. And those, that matters. And I, I think that we're missing that. Nobody wants to show up at a six o'clock meeting when it takes them an hour and 20 minutes to get home. So we have to figure a better way of that communication and that dialogue. And um, again, you disadvantaged community on, on that opportunity, cultural there as well. And um, just, you know, making sure that those stakeholders, that that part of the equity is being um, looked at, you know, considered. You know, we, we get a lot of people that are really proactive one way or the other on bicycles and um, the committees and organizations, but these are folks that don't, nurse, they don't come out to the, 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 the community room for discussion, but we'll have that kind of impact. And so we need to make sure that uh, the, that representation happens. Thank you. Commissioner Rodkin. So my comments go along the same lines as the ones we just heard. I, I, I'm speaking at that sort of general level of consideration. Um, first of all, I do appreciate the work the staff put into this, and I, the, the, what's positive about it is the economic analysis uh, in the scope that I think is very well done and doesn't need much modification. Any, from my point of view, any modification. Just to express a general concern to make this move more towards you know where we're going to go with this, I'm not comfortable either. Um, you know, sort of just, to, I'm certainly not comfortable just approving that as it is now and say, fine, it's done. I'm also not comfortable just directing staff in a vague way, hey, could you buff, could you beef up the, um, that's, maybe that's not the right word in a vegan community here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to, to uh, strengthen the, the analysis of the uh, environmental issues and the underserved communities question. And all of it, we spent, almost two years, well over a year, trying to figure out that we wanted a public transit option on this corridor. And there's still people coming to our meetings and writing me emails, you know, have, have not accepted the fact that we made a unanimous decision about that. I don't like the idea of putting stuff off, but I also find that if you write a scope of work and then it's not what you want it to be, you'll pay for it in the long run. You'll have to go back and redo pieces. And well, when you're finally done with it, people won't trust the product and they're gonna sort of, un, you know, think, oh, you didn't do this right. So I, I'm not going to make a motion, but I'm certainly inclined towards doing something more than just have vague direction to staff to like strengthen that part of it. I think it's going to take us more time to, for us to be clear about what's missing. I'm sure staff can help us do that by coming back and suggesting language that we could then look at, and that's what I'd feel a lot more comfortable with. So without making a motion, I just want to express my concern is 
you know, people say we want this stuff yesterday and we want it done quickly, but I want it done right. And I think this is such an important project that's going to last for decades for this community that it's worth taking the time to make sure the scope of work for something we're going to spend easily over $100 million on, should, we should take the time necessary to do it right. So I'm prepared to see this put off with clear instructions on what we want it to come back looking like, but I'm not going to make that motion at this point. Any other questions before I open it up to the public? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the public. Anybody from the public like to address this topic? Don't be afraid to be first. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Brett Garrett. I'm part of uh, Santa Cruz PRT, and I want to thank Commissioner Rotkin for his comments encouraging more explicit instructions to care for the environment and the climate. Um, both the city and the county of Santa Cruz have declared a climate emergency, as we know. Uh, the city of New York has just joined in declaring a climate emergency. Um, and I want to say I think it's critical for the scope of work to include studying our best options for dealing with climate change, including mitigation and adaptation. Um, I'm often elevating for, I'm often advocating for an elevated personal rapid transit system, PRT, also known as an automated transit network, ATN. Uh, PRT can reduce carbon emissions both by making transit more efficient and by e encouraging more people to use transit. Um, it makes transit more efficient by being lighter than an electric car, fewer empty seats traveling with less weight per empty seat traveling up and down our county. Um, and it travels at a uniform speed instead of a lot of stopping and starting. So it just, it just, it's more efficient. Um, and people using the system experience less waiting and it's more, more convenient, more comfortable. And it's fun. You get great views by being in an elevated vehicle and looking at the scenery. Um, and I also think the rail trail will be more pleasant to use if the transit is overhead instead of right next to the trail. So I had a couple of specific suggestions for the scope of work. Um, one, we're throwing around the phrase high capacity public transit. I don't think we've defined what we mean by high capacity. Um, I think many people would interpret high capacity to mean something like BART or Caltrain. Um, we might want to say something like appropriate capacity or define what capacity we want. Um, and I'd strongly encourage to define the capacity in terms of passengers per hour, which is very different from passengers per vehicle. You, don't, you, you can accomplish a very effective transportation system with very small pod cars. It doesn't require a lot of vehicles to carry a lot of passengers per hour. Um, I also want to encourage in task 2.1 to cite some citizen provided studies. Um, Santa Cruz PRT engaged uh, PRT consulting for a study that uh, it's linked in the paper that I sent around showing that an elevated automated transit network could provide superior results for the criteria that were established in the UCS. Um, <coughs> And yeah, I'm running out of time, but I just want to also encourage the triple bottom line and stating that explicitly as people have talked about. The climate is crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Arco. I, I'm a Santa Cruz resident, last 10 years. Um, not been before this body before. Uh, witnessing what I saw this morning, I want to thank you for what's an impressive process, a very critical process for our community. I'm here um, already comforted by the discussion around this topic uh, to amend the scope of work. Um, as a professional designer, I uh, have witnessed that the values and specific criteria in a scope of work document drive, in fact, waterfall throughout the, the project. And, so getting it right is a, uh, in the beginning is, a, is, a, is the right thing to do. <clears throat> so specifically uh, around the uh, ecological and uh, uh, equitable issues. Um, it's clear 
while I got involved and interested in, in the rail trail project as a cyclist, that this is not a short-term project. Uh, this is a legacy project that um, I'll probably time out on the, the benefits. Uh, but my, uh, as we're doing this for the future, let's make it worthy of uh, future generations and do uh, the right process to get to that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Diane Dreyer. I'm a resident of the county. Uh, I was going to make my own statement today, but I'm um, going to read a statement from Bruce Sawhill, who uh, had to leave at noon today. So this is Bruce's statement, and mine is similar, and I agree with him. He says, I know it's easy to get impatient with studies and just say, let's build something already. The rail corridor is the great transportation opportunity of our generation and perhaps another generation or two besides. It's worth taking some time to get it right. What I'd like to talk about is paying for it. We've already had a rail feasibility study completed several years ago and producing encouraging results for the viability of a well-designed trail system in our county though it was a cursory study built around dated technology. Then we had a unified corridors investment study, not specifically about the rail corridor, but including it. It also pro produced encouraging results around rail service, combined with positive but weaker results about BRT service on the rail line. This brings us to the alternatives analysis to be discussed today. It is going to look at rail or BRT service on the rail corridor. This study will cost money, money which will come primarily from Measure D. It seems very likely to me that whatever happens on the rail line will be run by Metro because we're a small county and there's no reason for multiple transportation agencies. In the original formulation of Measure D, the rail line was to get 20% of proceeds and Metro about 15. After a lot of horse trading, the rail line got whittled all the way down to 8% and Metro's share grew slightly. I propose that the funding of this study be shared by Metro and the RTC's Measure D funds. It is a study that involves both bus and rail alternatives, and even the rail alternative will be considered in concert with coordinated bus service. Both groups need to have skin in the game for this important study that has such long-reaching consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, hi Caltrans. Um, my name is Jessica Evans and I live in Santa Cruz on the Lower West Side. Um, I just have a few brief comments um, on the proposal for the scope um, for the alternatives analysis. Um, my, I'm looking at task 3.1, develop goals, criteria, and performance measures. And um, just a little bit concerned that um, leaving that whole piece so much kind of to the consultant uh, is a bit of a, um, could be a mistake. That, you know, as a community, it's important that we come together and develop some goals, criteria, and performance measures, and that we then give those to the um, consultants, you know, put those out for bid and say, you know, who, which of you is going to do the best job um, with these goals, criteria, and performance measures? Because we have, we have our own ideas in this community about what <laughs> is important, and um, and we may end up with a whole lot of bids, um, or a whole lot, you know, may could potentially even end up with a with a study that doesn't really address what it is that we want. I mean, I hope that wouldn't happen, but I feel like that there is some concern that certain components of our community haven't been effectively 
reached out to even up until now, even with all the public process that we've had. Um, so I would like to see a little bit more public process go into setting up the criteria for putting this out there for bid, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and then I'm looking at your bullet points here, um, transit ridership, transit travel time, vehicle miles traveled and associated greenhouse gas emissions, just specifically I feel like um, vehicle miles traveled is a really narrow way to look at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'd like to see greenhouse gas emissions tied to individual people, people miles traveled. So for every person who moves down the corridor, how much greenhouse gases are emitted, not, not looking at, at vehicle miles. Um, and um, I also would like to see, I hope that this would end up in there, but I would like to see some direct assessment of, um, of bicycle capacity as part of this, um, this alternatives analysis because I feel like, you know, we, we, we talk about the last mile issue a lot and, and I have a vision that um, a lot of people would be, like to be able to bring their bike onto a transit vehicle with them and then get off at the other end and go where they're going. Thank you, you um, need to wrap up. Yep, so that's all I had to say actually, but I, I, I encourage you to take your time and, and get it, uh, get it, Get it right. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm David Van Brink, a 31 year resident of uh, the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, as a citizen, I appreciate the depth and thoroughness uh, of the investigation and analysis that has gone on so far. And I think this is the first time that I'll be testifying to say, please, please wait about something. Uh, there's an old business joke. Uh, we lose. Uh, we lose money on every sale, but we make up for it in volume. Of course, in business, this is a, uh, a mode of failure. The objectives listed here seem largely concerned with affordability. And if we're looking to be ultimately affordable, we probably shouldn't do public transit at all. Um, so what we'd like to see more in the alternatives analysis is some questions like which will which uh, alternative will protect the continuity of the corridor right of way? Uh, which will best accommodate and encourage active transportation users? Uh, which will help get the rail trail built fastest? Uh, which will best facilitate moving people out of cars and onto public transit as uh, choice riders definitely have some preferences on that that will, the choice can help move them out of their cars? Uh, which would use the least amount of energy per passenger mile and other factors not yet identified. So please uh, continue to seek public input to appropriately scope the alternatives analysis to uh, cover it as broadly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Saladin Sale. I'm a 50-year county resident and a retired risk manager. After decades of work, the RTC is about to commission the alternatives analysis leading to the determination of the best use of the rail corridor. The final form of the scope of work for the consultant is absolutely critical to the ultimate success of what will be a huge transportation project, one that will affect transportation planning for at least the next 25 years. I believe there's no reason to feel rushed regarding approval of the initially proposed scope of work. There's no significant opposition to the project, so it's absolutely proper to take a month or two to solicit public comment on the scope of work. While staff evidently concurs with commenters' views regarding the importance of clearly incorporating the triple bottom line, I believe this needs to be foundational as opposed to being a handshake add-on developed with a consultant. At the least, the environmental and social justice effects must spe uh, specifically be strengthened and clarified in the scope of work and introduction so that they more accurately reflect the values of our community. While no one thinks this is just another RFP, it is worth remembering that when setting sail for a distant port, failing to set the proper course at the beginning means arriving at something other than the desired destination. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce um, and a strong advocate for Mr. D, as all you know. Uh, I've reviewed this uh, scoping and I want to thank the staff for doing a great job, except they missed one major, major point, public input. I know that so scoping is to set the stage and then you go to out and then you hire a contractor to help facilitate the community spirit of the organization. I don't think you did a good job in this particular regard and I would encourage you to take a look at that before you actually initiate it. Uh, I'd like to have the comments from some of the commissioners about maybe amending the scope of work before you take it to the Metro tomorrow. And I think I would encourage you to take that step. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Botroff and commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a 30 something year resident of the city and county and also a professional civil engineer who spent his life as a consultant. And I think you've heard the comments from others. There's uh, some things missing from this proposal, this uh, RFP. It doesn't set the right tone for the work that needs to be done. And as a consultant, I can tell you that that's, that task 3.1 that Ginger was referring to, you know, that lists the, like, that's the thing that you're emphasizing, right? You want these 14 things really looked at well, one of those is about the environment, one of those is about social equity. So as a consultant, you're gonna go, oh, okay, I'm putting together a business plan and I need to pay a little bit of attention to the environment, a little bit of attention to social equity, but this is the main focus of my work. And that's the, that's the proposal you're gonna get back. Um, and that's, that's not okay. The, the, you know, the, the essential piece of work here is that those three elements, the economy, equity, and the environment get equal footing. And this, this RFP does not communicate that. Um, so, you know, you might think, well, we need to get moving, you know, and I think that's a legitimate thing. I want to get moving. I like getting stuff done. I've spent my whole career getting stuff done. That's what I do. Um, but in this case, if you think you're going to save time by pushing ahead now, I think you're likely to see that you're actually going to be delayed because the consultant is going to come back and he's going to say, well, gee, I you know, met with the public and wow, this scope's blowing up. I got all this additional work. I got to figure out how to get that work done. I got to hire more consultants to help me do the environmental piece and do the equity piece. And you're going to end up with months and months of delay and, and lots and lots of additional cost. So let's get this right. Let's set the tone today before we solicit RFPs and let's get the kind of study we really want to make the most important decision this body will ever make about transportation in our county. What we're talking about is the kind of transportation that's gonna serve our community for the next 30 years or 50 years, maybe longer, and it's gonna cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's get this right. Another month or two here, not gonna make any difference at all, but getting the right answer will make all the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Keith Otto. Uh, the one additional item that I would add would be um, when the results of the study come back, is there enough um, uh, budget and time and effort to be able to respond to the public uh, comments and questions? Recall with the corridor study, right? That was an item that came back to you to fund additional efforts there. Um, you know, there's one person that's missing here from the audience today, most, most notably, uh, and that's uh, Brian Peoples from Trail Now. But fear not, he has sent me his comments for me to read into the record. Uh, so, from Brian Peoples Trail now on uh, item 18 here before you, uh, transportation design for how best to use the Santa Cruz uh, Coastal Corridor should be based on maximum utilization of the corridor for transit. Based on the corridor study, the maximum utilization of the corridor is operating as a trail designed for transportation. Using the corridor as a trail showed there'd be five times more users than a train or a bus. In addition to the type of transit on the corridor, the analysis should include when will it be used for transit. Waiting decades for a coastal corridor for transportation is a major issue. Our community needs to use the corridor now for alternatives to Highway 1. We ask that the study not be exclusive to publicly operated transit solutions, but look at new types of transit solutions that are being created with technology advancements designed as tra uh, transportation trail, the study should include the use of pedicabs, rickshaws, jump bikes, Uber type services. In addition to the type of transit, we ask 
how segments of the corridor could be upgraded to make, the tran to make transit more effective. For example, converting the corridor into an asphalt path for active transportation could include under and overpasses at key corridor road crossings, such as 41st, 17th, and 7th. That will make the corridor a more effective transit solution, and it's affordable for our community. Such under or overpasses would not be economically possible for a multi-ton transit vehicle, a train or a bus, but it is possible for active transit solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Go ahead and close the public, uh, bring it back for a discussion. Commissioner Rodkin. Uh, two points. First, I'm pleased to see that um, Brian Peoples still thinks that we should go back to a, a trail-only plan despite our unanimous decision. Some things never change, even when he's not here. Um, the um, the one one concern that Hard I have for people to hear you, Mike. Gotta get closer to that mic. I think it yeah. might be that mic yeah. or no, that. On, I guess is that working no, now? Just closeness. Okay. Proximity. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know whether we can determine this short of you know court cases taking decades that end up at the U.S. Supreme Court, but somehow the scope of work needs to give us some uh, have the consultant to give us some partial answers at least to. How likely would a something that does not involve rail coverage leave us having to rebuy half of the the corridor? I mean, I, I again, whether we can find that out short of that kind of long term, lots of expenses, but some more information about it. I I have no idea at this point how much of that uh, right of way we own outright versus how much of it is a sort of passage over based on the rail stuff signed in the 1880s. Um, and I don't know that we can get definitive answers to it, but I'd, I'd feel a lot more comfortable looking at alternatives, knowing that you know one of the, some of them that we're studying don't involve rail, they involve you know whether it's bus rapid transit or PRT or whatever the other options are, or perhaps part of the trail, part of the service being on rail and partly not on rail or whatever. I think that needs to be strengthened in the scope uh, explicitly, that that's something that they're going to give us at least some better sense of what the answer to that question is. Um, I, I'll wait for a motion to hear from other people, but I'm prepared to offer a motion that we do put this off uh, if uh, that seems to be the sentiment of the group, which I think we're leaning towards. We'll see. I second it. I don't think he made a motion. He was kind well, of fish not. it was fishing. Not. That was a fishing expedition. Sure sounded like it. I think we're going to wait for maybe some comments from others, sure. and then maybe someone will follow up with a motion. Commissioner Mulhern, I haven't heard from you all day. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so w one thing that I heard a lot of people talk about um, sort of our process for the UCIS, and one person uh, referenced that we we had to go back to our consultant. Uh, with extra funding to answer some of the the outstanding questions that we had and 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 they're they're right um, and I I I would echo that concern um, also for me missing from from the UCIS was a, a discussion of, of opportunity cost so transportation funding is a zero-sum game right you can spend your money on this or you can spend your money on that, but you can't spend it on both. There's a finite amount of funding available for transportation projects, whether it's capital or operations. Um, what I would like to see discussed in this document then is, is uh, if we use this money for this project, we won't be able to use this money for all of these projects. So for example, um, the surface transportation block grant, STBG, we've been talking a lot about this over the past couple of months. That money can be used for transit capital projects, or it can be used for federal, uh, federal aid, local streets and roads. So if we use the STBG money for transit capital projects, we would not be able to use it for local streets and roads. So I would like to see a discussion of, of, of situations like that where, where our, our, our funding priorities, <coughs> as, as listed in the 2040 RTP, would come in conflict, and so we can make a better decision about how we're spending the money. Um, um, I, I'll, I realize that this is gonna be a huge digression as well, um, but my, one of my other frustrations with the UCS was that we were presented with a preferred alternative. And it wasn't our preferred alternative, it was 
a combination of staff and consultants' preferences based on the, the, the sort of the, the, the environment that we established at the beginning. They came back with, to us with um, a preferred alternative. I would like for us, the, or rather the commission, to establish the, the preferred alternative and for um, the process to be interrupted, say around step six, where we're, the commission is presented with a menu of options with all the various metrics that we've defined and the, the performance measures. And then we discuss at the commission in a public meeting which of those performance measures are most important to us and then decide what our preferred project is and then proceed with the process. So steps, task seven then would proceed with, uh, you know, the, the, the whatever your analysis reports and the more public input and uh, the administrative draft, all those things would proceed after the commission decides upon a preferred alternative. Um, I, I, I don't know, hopefully I've made that clear enough, but, but my, part of my, a lot of my frustration with the UCS was that we, we the commission, didn't hash out project versus project what we would like to have seen in, all, in, in our, 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 our scenario. Um, I would like for us to, be, to have a menu of projects to discuss and weigh the various metrics against each other. And I'll underscore this here, and I, I, this is of course gonna be unpopular, but this is not a technical decision that we're being presented here. The, the analysis and the reports and everything sort of give you the main of, of a technical decision, but it's ultimately a political decision. And we're gonna make that decision based on our values, how we value the various metrics that are put forth here, but also based on the constituencies that we represent. And so it, it, it makes more sense to me to have the decision fall with, with the commission to address these sort of uh, political metrics that can't be defined in a technical process. Is that a motion? Uh, no, I'm hoping that that could be included in. I'll, I'll make a motion, but there are plenty of people to talk to. We'll, we'll, we'll keep having discussion. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate the, the testimony. Um, I think uh, th uh, this process is, is a good, uh, we're off to a good start. I don't, I don't want to knock what, what, what's gone on. I really appreciate the efforts by Mr. Preston, and uh, Mr. Clifford at the Metro and, and staff to try to work on a document where these two agencies are working together on a critical uh, transportation decision. And so um, that, that part is very good. And this is an RFP for consultants, so I don't see this as, as like a major public process. So for, for those uh, who thought that there should be a public process to figure out the RFP to get the consultant, no, I'm, I'm not willing to, uh, to, to go there. I think that um, this commission has shown its interest and its effort to try to uh, do outreach into the community. And where we have fallen short, we should continue to strive to be better. But we can say that we have engaged loads more people, hundreds of more people in, in the decision making um, or in, in the process uh, than we did five years ago or 10 years ago. There's a lot more people involved. And, and in this alternative analysis, there's gonna be a lot of people involved. Um, we don't need it before the RFP, but there's gonna be people involved with, uh, with this effort. I do think that because this is a partnership effort that we need to explicitly um, um, state the frame in which we look at things um, uh, and talking about the triple bottom line and uh, ensuring that whatever consultant looks at this uh, understands that we're, we're gonna be looking at decisions through a prism, um, I think that will be helpful. I don't have specific language, but I think that that could be incorporated. I thought that Ms. Dicard did a good job in her presentation to us talking more about it that, that wasn't reflected in the actual document. So I think there's something there that could be, uh, 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 something that could be added. Um, uh, my colleagues have made some uh, additional suggestions um, about the question of ownership, easement, uh, and, and that's a, that's a, <laughs> 
it's a constant and ongoing decision. There may be some of it that we don't want in a public document. You know, we, you know, you have to, you have to figure out. I, I, I'm going to leave it. I would say leave it to staff to to, to figure out uh, that part of it. Obviously, if we choose an alternative, that means we lose the the, the corridor. Um, it's it's a game ender, right? I mean, it's you know you have to figure that out. Uh, but I also don't want to tip our hands in in a way that would be uh, sensitive. Uh, to my colleague, uh, Mr. Mulhern, you, you know, every decision we make is political. We are politicians, and uh, and. Um, I don't feel constrained by getting expert opinions. I feel informed by getting expert opinions. And so I, I, don't, I think there's an appropriate place to say we would like to know more w with these kind of factors. But I do want to also look to transportation experts um, to give us some good information for the ultimate decision we make. The, the decision we make is ours. And if, and if we don't like a recommendation, um, we've all voted against staff recommendations. We've all changed staff recommendations. Um, we've all suggested alternatives to, to staff recommendations. That's, that's part and parcel of what we do, and um, it's what we will continue to do. Uh, and uh, I want to benefit from, um, from the transit knowledge that's out there, whether it be from the RTC staff or the Metro staff. Um, I think that, that it helped me make an informed decision. Um, but it doesn't mean that we should that that we shouldn't make sure that at the appropriate points they come back and we can express kind of what the things that we're seeing uh, in this process. Um, I do think we shouldn't go forward with this at this meeting, and I think if it's possible to come back at our August meeting, and I'll and I'll look to staff to see whether that's a crazy idea or not to come back with this at an August meeting. So you have had some d discussion uh, with Metro. Uh, we could hopefully then, at the beginning of the month, take a, um, a vote on it. And then there's three weeks later that they would take a vote on it at their regularly scheduled meeting. This, is, this happens to be, it's weird that the RTC is meeting um, on Thursday and the Metro. That's not usually on Friday. But that's not uh, a, something we usually do. But we, it, we're in a strange month, and so strange things are happening. Uh, so my motion would be to, con uh, to continue this item to our August meeting, unless the staff tells me that, 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 that they can't do this by August, um, to incorporate the triple bottom line uh, uh, elements um, uh, based on the conversation uh, and testimony that we've uh, received uh, and come back to us in, in August uh, uh, with hopefully something that we can get out. So I definitely think that's doable. Um, there's some challenges, of course, associated with that. Um, we've got some staff vacations, some critical staff vacations that have been scheduled um, around this current schedule, you know, such that they would be on vacation while the consultants were working and then come back and have the, the, the proposals available to us. Um, but I do think it can be done. Um, I think I can handle this um, with some input from staff. I will be here. Um, I do want to really express um, my gratitude to the public for the amount of input that they've provided and their desire to have a lot of public input in this. And I think um, Commissioner Leopold brought up a very good point. It's, it's actually very unusual for us to bring a scope of services um, for <laughs> public input and involve the public in actually um, preparing the scope of services. Um, the fact that we did so and brought it to this commission before releasing it um, was because we understood the level of input and concern by the public that regarding this subject. So um, we put it out there. It was also very challenging to work with Metro to come up with the scope of services. Metro was very focused on the bottom line and what it would do to their operations. And um, we went back and forth on a lot of the bulleted points that they wanted to have included in the scope of services to the extent that we probably could have done a better job of making sure we didn't not uh, properly weight the triple bottom line concept. Um, we heard the public um, by the uh, amount of comments that we received before this meeting so that we were prepared to address that issue. Um, it's important to note that um, the list included in, in 
task 3.1 was um, for demonstration purposes only. It was not meant to be a final list of performance measures. Um, there is a specific task to develop a public and stakeholder outreach plan and that the uh, performance measures that the consultant comes up with goes to the RTC and Metro boards as part of task 5.4. So they were very much involved. Task 5.3 was to include the public and then the additional task and, and uh, task seven was also to go back out to the public and, and also to the board. So we very much um, we're emphasizing public participation and we'll continue to do so, but I have absolutely no problem with uh, taking the additional time um, to try to um, refine the scope of services to address the comments that were received today. And before I take a second, I just could you go again and repeat your motion so I'm clear? Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks. So Yesenia would be very happy with that too. <laughs> that we continue this item till August to incorporate language based on the conversation we've had here focusing on the triple bottom, triple bottom lines. So I will second that, and I'll also, uh, with, uh, well, maybe I'll give people a moment to, but if we're gonna continue an item and we're gonna have this discussion again, then unless, unless it's going to the work that's gonna occur between now and then, people should really focus on, on just that a aspect, because that's all we're really voting on uh, right now. And so um, given the hour and the time we should, if we're going to have an entirely new discussion about this item in, in, do it in two months, let's not do it twice. I think we have a motion that incorporates the comments we've already had, and and yeah. and we don't need. I, I I don't feel a need for any other comments unless somebody feels like they have one that's imperative. I, I just Rogers. want to say, if anybody objects to the comments that others made, they need to you know say something because, for example. When I talked about the right-of-way issue, I accept John's, uh, whoever made the comment back that we don't want to do stuff that's going to put us in legal jeopardy. But if that's fine with everybody, I have nothing else to say about I, it. But, I think I, the, but the, someone the, should speak up if they think yeah. that's a terrible mm -hmm. idea. I think the motion from Commissioner was an overview to allow you know the comments that were made, all inclusive, to be to deliver a better project product that we could vote on. Yeah, I, I think that it's important though that. Um, I'm just wondering if another month, you know, for, we heard about the public input; they wanted more of that. Um, uh, I just want to have make sure everybody spreads the word that uh, this is where we're headed. We're delayed this, but uh, get your public input. You just you know, did. Okay. Yes, right. Uh, yeah, you, right. you just gave fair warning, yeah. all right? Yeah, send it to 1913. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, with, with, that, with that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, um, item 19. From the other side of the country, our our uh, legal representative, federal, federal legislative update, Chris. How are you? Hello. I'm fine, thanks. Welcome uh, back Chairman. for a while. Okay, it's one. Yeah, one o'clock. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I was told I needed to uh, make my 60 slide PowerPoint down to 40, <laughs> so I will try my best. Uh, okay. Thank I'll you for having me, Mr. Preston. Thank you for having me as well today, too. Uh, uh, I do try to keep up with, you know, with, with the monthly packets for your meeting to see, you know, how things are going on. But it's great to be here and to actually, you know, kind of see what's going on and see the, the interaction with the public and, and, and you folks as well. And um, I do have a, a memo in the packet that kind of outlines kind of my federal update as to kind of where things stand right now. I'll, I'll hit a couple of the highlights. But I also did want to mention a couple of things that, that kind of came to my mind uh, throughout the discussion, particularly uh, on the finance uh, deal and the, and the bonding and, you know, uh, Commissioner Caput, you talked about Measure D and leveraging and things like that, and, uh, and Mr. Preston did a nice job of sort of outlining sort of the benefits of that. Um, I, I'll give you a sort of a real-world example uh, on the federal level. There's a very, very popular program called BUILD. It used to be called TIGER uh, at the Department of Transportation. It's about a billion dollar a year, super competitive grant program. Statutorily, um, the, uh, the local match is 20%. If you were to submit an application with a 20% match, there is no way you will get funded. Uh, everybody is over matching, and particularly this administration likes to see more uh, local uh, contributions to their grant applications. Uh, and so having, you know, having something like Measure D uh, funds to kind of fall back on to, you know, to, to do that sort of overmatch. 
uh, would be really important. Uh, I'd also mention uh, on the sort of the bonding side, uh, a couple of programs that the k and folks mentioned, uh, sort of alphabet soup stuff, but TIFIA is a loan program at the Department of Transportation that does large scale road and transit projects. And then there's the RIF program at the Federal Railroad Administration, which also is a loan program for kind of capital projects related to uh, rail uh, improvements. Both of those uh, have been underutilized uh, in, in recent years, and not just in recent years, it, since they were created uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, they're, they're tough programs to kind of get through the, the process of, uh, and, so, and, and so, you know, the Department of Transportation is, hasn't used nearly as much of the loan authority that it has with that program. So uh, that's kind of food for thought. Uh, final bonding thing too, and probably a lot of you folks, uh, the uh, electeds on, on this understand that, you know, back in 2017, um, the tax exempt status of municipal bonds was very, very much in question. It was going to be used as something to pay for uh, the individual and corporate tax cuts in that 2017 uh, tax bill. Local elect Elected officials really fought hard uh, to save that, and it and it remains intact. So, um, so I'll, I'll I'll move along. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, since President Trump was elected, that he has been talking about, and others in this sort of transportation industry have been talking about, it's the possibility of a of an infrastructure package. President during the campaign spoke of a big, beautiful infrastructure package. Lots of folks thought that maybe this was something that the president could work with, uh, work with Democrats on. Um, that has not been the case. Uh, I would probably declare uh, an infrastructure package, at least uh, right now, is kind of dead as a doornail. Uh, not going to happen until a, a, a next administration, uh, be it uh, President Trump being reelected or somebody else. Um, I don't think it ever had um, a, a significant chance. Uh, you kind of, in Congress, have to be uh, in, in the top one or two priorities uh, of a president. Very rarely do they get to number three. Right now, the president is very concerned about the border. Uh, he's also concerned about trade. Infrastructure has not crept into his, his priority. Um, uh, on, another, on the other hand, also getting a, an infrastructure package through the Republican Senate. Lots of Republican senators are, were wary of adding uh, to the deficit and an infrastructure package would probably have resulted in that. So probably uh, I would say in 2021, we'll do a reset on this and, and maybe start all over again, but, but for now, not so much. Um, However, uh, I will say that in the last couple of years, with regard to the Department of Transportation's budget, we've seen sort of something of a mini stimulus in there. Um, you probably have seen lots of the president's uh, recommendations. His budget each year uh, proposes some pretty deep cuts to programs uh, all, all across the board, but also at the Department of Transportation. Congress, in a very bipartisan way, has rejected those proposed cuts for the last few years uh, and, uh, and, and, and will likely continue to do that. Uh, and so we've seen uh, increases in lots of programs having to do with both highways, rail, uh, and transit. Uh, and, and, that, and so that's, that's been a positive. I think that uh, uh, ten, in, in FY18 and FY19 each, there was about $10 uh, billion in additional funding kind of spread across highway rail uh, transit programs. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that's been a positive. Uh, I will caution uh, that what we need to do in order to continue that train rolling uh, in FY20 and 21 is to get a budget deal uh, between the president and uh, Congress. Right now, uh, there are very, very tight overall budget caps on, on overall federal spending. And in 2011, uh, uh, Congress and the Obama administration came to an agreement on a deficit reduction package. It was a 10-year package that set some very tight overall spending levels in order to get $1.5 trillion in savings. We're in those out years of that budget agreement, and the, 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 uh, the, the caps are super tight. Uh, Congress and the president have lifted those caps for FY18 and 19. Um, for FY20 and 21, it's 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 getting a little more dicey. The president uh, expressed regret that he lifted those caps uh, last time around, uh, and is probably going to use them as leverage uh, for things like his trade, his Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Uh, and potentially for for border wall funding. So, uh, so that we may we may be into the fall and into 
into early next year on these on these budget uh, on these budget battles. If you know if we are to prevail and the ta and the caps are lifted, it's going to look pretty good. We're going to get these sort of small increases that we've been getting for the last few years. If not, probably about a ten per at least a ten percent across the board cut uh, to to programs as they as they currently exist. And again, not just in transportation, um, but across the board. Um, I might mention too that the next kind of you know transportation infrastructure package may come in the form of, uh, of a reauthorization, a multi-year reauthorization of highway and transit funds. Uh, the alphabet soup uh, we, we are dealing with right now, they call it the FAST Act. It's an acronym for something, but that author, that's a five-year bill that was uh, approved by Congress in 2015, uh, and it authorizes the you know, federal gas tax funds to go into the highway trust fund and to be spent uh, on highway and transit programs. It expires at the end of 2020. Uh, and, uh, and so that could be a potential vehicle for infrastructure. Again, won't be called a, a straight infrastructure package, but if Congress and the president can come to an agreement on how to fund uh, increases to, to those programs, you could, you could probably consider that uh, to be uh, an infrastructure package. Uh, it's going to be hard to come up with those revenues. Uh, we haven't uh, increased the federal gasoline tax in 30 years. Stands at about 18.3 cents per gallon, and, um, and Congress has not been willing to uh, increase it in the past. Uh, just to, if we were to do a, a five-year reauthorization of the FAST Act in 2020, um, because of um, a slowdown in, in, in gas tax money going into the Highway Trust Fund, we need just a, we need an additional hundred billion dollars just to stay where we are right now. So it's going to be very very difficult. Uh, I would not expect in 2020 to see a reauthorization of the Fast Act. It's an election year. Making members vote on a gas tax increase in an election year is probably not going to happen. So we'll see small extensions of it. Uh, but hopefully. Eventually, people will kind of get together on, on some sort of funding vehicle uh, to, to fund this program. Um, and then finally, I would mention uh, the, uh, something that's been mentioned a couple of times throughout this meeting, and that is uh, the idea of, of reimbursement from the Federal Highway Administration for storm damages to, to county roads. And I know uh, every one of the... Uh, of the uh, county supervisors has been really active in trying to turn this around. Uh, it's been very frustrating uh, to get the attention of the Federal Highway Administration to, um, uh, to our plight and to start to you know, provide extensions uh, that we need to, uh, to get these projects into construction. Um, the congressional delegation has been working very hard on a, both on a legislative and an administrative basis, trying to push FHWA to, to keep, to reverse their, their policies right now of rejecting these extensions. Uh, we're also uh, have kind of a two pronged approach legislatively, uh, to, to do this. Uh, one is to, uh, on a long-term basis, change the laws. You know, right now it's just virtually impossible to get a, a road project into construction within two years, uh, you know, given all the planning and environmental work that's needed for that. So trying to change the law in that fast act reauthorization, but also in the short term, we've got reimbursements for 2016 and 2017 storms that are, uh, that have to come and they've got to, you know, they've got to come quicker than this fast act will go. So we're also trying legislatively to, to, to include language in whatever bill is moving that would prevent FHWA from implementing this, uh, essentially implementing this, this two-year rule. So again, like I said, uh, Congresswoman Eshoo, Congressman Panetta have been really uh, on the front lines trying to, trying to help out with this. We've sort of, through the California State Association of Counties, kind of stretched this out to lots of other counties in California that are experiencing the same thing. And so uh, particularly uh, Congressman Jared Huffman, Congressman John Garamendi have been really, really helpful on a legislative basis trying to, trying to push this through. The real difficulty is, unfortunately, when you have gridlock in Congress, there is no vehicle to attach the language onto. Nothing's passing besides you know, judicial appointments in the Senate. And so finding that vehicle has been very, very difficult and frustrating for us. We continue to work on it. Uh, we're trying to get as many partners as we can. Uh, uh, Supervisor Friend is, is running a resolution through the National Association of Counties at their annual meeting next year. So maybe we can get sort of national organizations involved in it. Like I said, CSAC's been very involved as well too. County Public Works is working, you know, kind of 24 seven on that. So uh, those were the main things. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you guys might have. 
Thanks. Any questions for Chris? Well, well, let me just say vote. that uh, I appreciate your work. Um, uh, I appreciate your help in getting the language in a bill that passed the House about the federal highway. Um, it's disappointing that we have a level of dysfunction that basic pieces, uh, almost everything you, you identified here is a basic piece of government that, they, that can't happen in Washington given the uh, atmosphere. And even though the president said on the night of his uh, victory, the only issue he talked about in his victory speech was infrastructure. It's hard to believe that, uh, that the best we can hope is an, a future administration, whether it be his, God help us, uh, or, uh, or, or another administration that, that will get to it when the needs are so clear in our community and throughout the country. Um, I, I don't think that there's a likelihood of a gas tax passing even after the election. Um, there's very, the, the, the side seem to have hardened um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to the day that one day we have a working legislature again in, in Washington. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's gotta be, it's frustrating for us, for someone who's there day for, after day, it's gotta be hard. So thank you for your work. Sure. It's, it's been frustrating. And, and I think, you know, and I think we've talked about this before, but I always feel like, you know, you talk to individual members from both parties and they understand that probably the gas tax is really the only way to sort of fund these programs right now. The, the vehicle miles traveled stuff is not quite you know, fully baked yet. And so I always think that, you know, the best time for a gas tax increase, you know, everybody joins hands, you know, the farthest away you can get from election and just bite the bullet and jump off the cliff together. So uh, hasn't happened yet. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, just to give some perspective of how serious this is for Santa Cruz County, um, I think of the, the 16, 17 storms that we in Santa Cruz County uh, had half of the damage, uh, storm related damage statewide to our transportation network. And uh, for the county itself, we've, uh, this year, uh, we just completed our budget session and we found a way, uh, a different way to do it, but we're covering some of the about $5 million, $6 million worth of repairs that need to be done that were promised, but haven't come forward from the federal government. And uh, more longer term, we're looking at uh, damages up to $35 million. So it's huge for Santa Cruz County. Uh, I appreciate your work and the work of all of our uh, local Congress members, Eshu and Panetta, as well as Garamendi and Huffman, and the County uh, State Association of, uh, or the County, uh, California State Association of Counties that uh, has, at a, I'm on the board of an executive committee that we have really made it a statewide push because there's other counties albeit uh, less uh, severely impacted than Santa Cruz County that are very much on board to try to make this happen. So we're trying to do a unified effort, but it's, uh, it's a long haul. But thank you for your work back in Washington, D.C. And it's, uh, you know, even though you're late in making your presentation, it's probably better than being back there right now, I bet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting alerts on my phone about heat index, you know, emergencies yeah, and yeah. stuff. I'm, it's, it's very nice to be here, but I, you know, uh, uh, Commissioner McPherson, you know, every, you know, any, every community in the country is going to have a disaster at some point, right? And, the, and so you would think that, that Congress and the federal government would, would be able to, to look at this in a way that, uh, that is reasonable. Uh, I'm sure they're finding a way in Alabama to, to give, grant the extension. Right. Commissioner Rodkin. Two things really quickly. I, the, first, it's really shocking about the gas tax when it's 18 cents, and that's a swing that happens every, you know, three times as much every summer or five times as much every summer. That somehow that that like the Congress doesn't have the courage to like you know raise it double it would not be had any significant impact doubling it would not have any impact on the price of gas compared to what people see every year in terms of swings. Um, the other comment is just to thank Chris for his work for us in Washington. I've been on several trips to D.C. from the city, from the transit district, and from the RTC in the past where he's represented us, and he just does really fine work for us. It, it, it's impressive how much he knows about the Congress and the various views people have and takes us basically to communicate, I think, effectively with the people that can make a difference. And if it's anything can be moved, this would be the person I want representing me there to make it happen, but my God, it, that's not work I would do. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. I just want to appreciate your work as well. And um, also, given the fact that every year is an election year these days, it must be even more challenging to think about that moment in time when it might be possible to move something like this. So thank you, and thanks for the report. Certainly. It, do, it does seem like uh, sort of the day after an election, you know, the, the next, the next two-year cycle, particularly in, in the House, starts again. Other comments? 
Chris, thank you for what you do, and I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you, sir. I'll try to do better. <laughs> All right. Um, brings us to uh, item 20. This is the Capitola Trestle Feasibility Study Update. Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Um, try to keep it brief. Um, so today I'm here to give you an update on the Capitola Trestle Feasibility Study. Um, this came about about a year ago um, as part of the uh, adoption of the 2018 Measure D five-year plan of projects, um, a member of the community requested this study be conducted to um, evaluate a replacement or modification to the Capitola uh, trestle or the bridges that make up the Capitola trestle um, to include both transit and trail on the bridge. Since that time, staff has been um, Waiting on, you know, the unified corridor study to define what the long-term future use of the corridor would be. Um, and then, as you remember earlier this year, um, we were directed to conduct this alternatives analysis to further, you know, develop what type of transit is going to be on the line. And so the, the feasibility study for the Capitola Trestle, um, it really makes sense to wait until we have a better, um, more clear understanding of what the long-term future use of the corridor is. Um, that way we don't um, waste um, funds and resources on developing, you know, developing a feasibility study for something that's already being developed as part of the alternatives analysis. So um, we've also been working on the bridge inspections. As you guys uh, recall, we have um, developed a on-call list of engineering consultants um, and we conducted the bridge um, inspections and load ratings as a task order under that on-call. Uh, they finished the uh, bridge inspections, but the load ratings are still uh, being worked on and we're still waiting a final report to come out. But we got some preliminary information back. We're in the process of reviewing that. Um, and the outcome of those inspections is there are uh, three out of the five bridges that make up the trestle that need some repair. Um, and so um, we're going to work on um, putting together a plan to get those um, up and running. But uh, in terms of the longer term feasibility study um, project, that is, uh, it really needs to wait until the completion of this alternatives analysis. Um, and so with that, I would like to request that we shift the $50,000 that was allocated for this next fiscal year to the following fiscal year that's gonna um, line up with the completion of the alternatives analysis. Great. Staff recommendation. Boom. <laughs> Any questions? One. Uh, Go ahead. I know everybody's ready. Um, believe me, I. You haven't been to our council. Uh, no, you haven't been to our council meetings, I guess. Um, I, th I think that there was one comment that I'm hearing out there is the historical value of the trestle. Um, I, I just want to know if that's going to be at all something that's going to be brought up when this comes through on looking at that and. I mean, I don't know how realistic, unrealistic it really is, but as long as there's a box check that there was something that was mentioned about um, its historical value on its use, no, no use if it's even considered within the realm of something that can be determined and has restrictive, you know, uses as a result of it being classified that way, just as long as we have the box check to sort of have something mentioned about that. Absolutely. So when that project moves forward, um, that's definitely part of the, um, both the feasibility study and the CEQA analysis will consider that. It's not just a plain old bridge that you can go out and, um, you know, spend a minimal amount of money replacing with a concrete, you know, structure. It's something that really somewhat defines the community and we're aware of that and um, we'll take that into consideration. This is, it's going to drive the cost up, but well, I mean, I, I, if there is none and it needs to come down or be replaced with something that's going to be actually usable that the community needs, then, then that's a whole different story. I just want to make sure that we don't have that become an issue that we didn't have that into the process of consideration and that there is something left mentioned about that. Because uh, honestly, I, with, with the number of bridges that you have there and the disrepair of things that really, you, you can't weld on rotted, you know, rusted iron. So there's 
definitely going to have to be a replacement. So it, it may have no value at all to, to do that. But I just don't want somebody to come along and say, I'm going to slap a lawsuit because it's a historical you know, value and, and then none of the community gets its use. And I just want to be sure that we've got it all covered, cover all of our bases, right? It sounds like Sarah has a plan. Okay. And I'm comfortable with that. Any other uh, questions? Uh, let me open up to the public. Anybody in the public want to comment on the trestle? Yes, sir. Come on. Keith Otto with um, another comment from Brian Peoples Trail Now. Um, regarding this item, item 20, the preliminary analysis of the Capitola trestle and un other timber trestles along the coastal corridor show that it's not practical to believe that these trestles could accommodate a multi-ton transit vehicle uh, traveling 45 miles an hour. The, the timber trestles are historical uh, landmarks for our community and will challenge any plans to destroy the trestle and replace them with concrete bridges to accommodate heavy transit vehicles. Using the coastal corridor for active transportation modes will allow the timber trestles to remain and provide transit solution today for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? I'll bring it back. I have a motion by Rodkin, second by Gonzalez. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And we're adjourned. Our next meeting will be uh, August 1st in Scotts Valley. TPW meeting on August 15th. Thank you. She's trying to make up for all the time. I'm like, no joy. Joy is off.